really, I'm so glad that you're all here. It's good to see you. Uh, I read a quote this week by a 1977 Nobel laureate. This is interesting. Noted for his work on dissipative structures, complex systems, and irreversibility. Like, I don't even know what that means, right? But here's the quote. When a system is far from equilibrium, small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos have the capacity to lift the system to a higher order. Now, I know that he was talking as a physical chemist about something else, but it, I think, directly applies to what we're trying to do here in our city through the initiative and through other efforts. I mean, I think San Antonio is just amazing in what we're doing. We're forming those small islands of coherence in a sea of chaos, lifting the system to a higher order. So we've invited Ben. Ben was here for a Pathways to Hope conference last August uh, on mental health, and I got to meet him. I didn't even know he existed. Uh, shorthand, I just refer to you, Ben, as the faith liaison out of DC, but that's not his title because it's really long. He's the program specialist at the Center for Faith and Opportunity Initiatives at the US Department and Health and Human Services. Did you even know that we had a Faith and Opportunities Initiative at the Department of Health and Human Services? And it's not new, right, Ben? And you're going to tell us about those things. Um, but he's really known for facilitating partnerships between faith-based, philanthropic, community organizations, the government, exactly what the initiative is doing, right? He's, he's known for that. And he also helps to strengthen those local faith-based and community leaders, just like he's come to do with us today. He's been doing this for 15 years at the center, and he's served in many roles, including the designated federal officer to the President's Advisory Council of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, a 25-member council of faith and community leaders making recommendations to the President and the White House. So if you can get his ear, it might be helpful. <laughs> you never know. He received his Master's in Organizational Development and Knowledge Management in 2007 from the School of Public Policy policy at George Mason University. He resides just outside of DC with his wife, Kristen, and practices his own personal fatherhood initiatives with his two girls. So Ben, it's all yours. OK. Ben, yay! <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Anne. Let me see, make sure this is on. Um, well, I, would, I just want to thank Anne and, and her whole team for bringing me here today, because I don't know if you've heard, but there's this polar vortex, like, freezing the rest of the country. And your guys are cold, but you're not as cold as they are. Um, actually, I'm, my phone is just, all these DC is saying, go home early, get out of the ice. I said, good, I left. I ran far away as I could. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've had a privilege of working with faith and community leaders um, at the national level um, from other countries, and then also some work in the international space, but mostly focused here domestically. And throughout that time, since President Bush, through the previous administration to President Trump, we've had a faith-based office, um, not just in health and human services, not just at the White House, but also spread throughout federal agencies doing this work to connect and coordinate with these organizations and individuals. And so when I got a chance to meet with Anne and hear about the work you guys are doing here, I can tell you it's some, some exciting work. There is more structure here at the local level with what you guys are doing than what I see in a lot of other places. And so I was excited to come and support the work you all are doing here and encourage that and to share what I can as far as examples and models that we're seeing from around the country that might support the work you're doing, might connect to some ideas and projects, and to have a back and forth. So my goal here as much today is for you to hear me as much as I can also hear from you. So I wanna encourage you to be thinking about what can I share? How can I contribute into this conversation and dialogue? And I will try and facilitate as much back and forth as I can as well. Let me also make sure you see that you have cards here. In every, I believe it's on every seat. Um, I want you to be thinking about your big idea. I want you to be thinking about the thing that could be something that you could implement. It might be something you're already doing. 
Um, it could be something that you grow and expand and build on top of. I want you to keep that. You might think of that idea while you're sitting here. You might kind of hear something and just think. We're going to use those ideas later, but I want you to know that if as you're sitting here and you're like, <gasps> aha moment. Um, my friend David Jenkins, he says that um, aha moments are duh moments in disguise. So you may be sitting there and you may be like, oh, oh duh, why didn't I think of this before? Write your duh moment, your aha moment on your card. We'll use them later. So in this work, we really want to think about how all these different organizations, all these different partners work together to affect change. And I know we have faith leaders here and we have community leaders here. We have community leaders who work with faith leaders here today. But I think one of the things I always start off with is saying is that I always think and encourage us to think about our faith leaders. I think sometimes we don't often include them in the systems that we think about. Um, and I think we can encourage the faith leaders to think about themselves as a part of a system. But it's so critical to think about where they fit. Um, faith Counts is a survey that's been done um, nationally. They found that 1.2 trillion is how much the faith sector contributes to our economy. So not to that as a contribute, we can actually put a monetary value on what faith leaders do. This is the mentoring they do. This is the support and care that they provide. This is services to elderly. This is partnerships and connections and feeding meals and all these different activities. When you have a chance to aggregate as much as we humanly can through this, this research that they've done, it's $1.2 trillion that they've contributed into the economy. There's so much that our faith communities can do and be a part of and connect to, and we need to think about where they fit how we leverage the strengths and abilities that they bring. I think here, too, we have to recognize that they have strengths that are different from the rest of the system. Many times faith communities care about people in need, and they are driven by that need, and they serve that need. And sometimes the systems think, well, I have a program, and my program's going to end. So they, but the faith community says, no, I have the people, and I want to serve the people, and they're just back and forth, problem, people, problem, people, problem, people, and this, yes, all of the above. It's got to be both of those things when we solve problems, because people are not just problems, and problems are not just people. It goes by hand in hand. We need to think about how these things work together, and strengths and abilities from each side work together. And so while we have this challenge on the nonprofit sector and the civic sector, it's also important to recognize that our nonprofit community and our service infrastructure is huge in our country. So I uh, recently came across a report by, I always forget their name, the o Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. When they looked at the national level of social spending in our country, U.S. ranks 22nd. And you kind of say, oh, man. When they include all social spending, we jump up to the second in the highest amount of social spending per, uh, per capita, no, I'm sorry, per percent of GDP when we compared with other countries. So from 22nd in the amount of spending to second in the amount of spending. That's the jump of, and that's the contribution of the civic sector. That's the contribution of nonprofits. That's the co contribution of individual donations that organizations and individuals, um, nonprofit, service organizations, Rotary, all those different organizations, we add that up, we're, we have significant amount of spending in our country, and it's really surpri surprising to some to recognize that a huge part of that work is smaller nonprofits, community-based organizations. Um, you may not know, I looked up this stat. In 2012, 66% of all nonprofits had a budget of 500000 or less. So these are not the nonprofits that you know. These are your smaller organizations that are right down the street. We passed a ministry on the way in. They're, they're not the big names. They're just people serving in their community and caring. All those organizations contribute huge to the total amount of social spending in our country, and I think we're unique in that element as well. Not only that, but we can monetarily val uh, estimate the value of the nonprofits in our community. The National Council of Nonprofits, again in 2012, Estimate that the nonprofit sector contributed $878 billion, with a B, uh, into our economy. So I think I share these numbers. Um, I often am, am struck by, um, I'll share a quick story. I worked with, uh, during the Bush administration, on a report that said the value and how many grant dollars went to faith communities. I would tell you I poured blood, sweat, and tears and part of an arm into the kind of trying to figure out this number. And I, 
the, the, where this is during the Bush administration, the president shares the number, and I'm ready to stand. I'm ready to clap. This is a huge number. You guys don't know what this means, and nothing happened. Like, no, no, this man passed. Later in the speech, a man, an individual was recognized. A, a gentleman who had put his life together from pre experiencing incarceration was a thriving part of his society, and he got a standing ovation. And I was like, but, but where's my standing ovation for my really cool number? It's a really cool number that's important. And I, I started to say at that point um, that, that outside the Beltway, out in communities, people care about stories, people care about lives. Inside the Beltway, people care about numbers. I've changed that story a little bit recently from a leader that I've talked to, Matt Bird. I learned from him that leaders care about numbers. When we go out and talk about what you're doing as faith leaders, what you're doing as a community, you need to have numbers because numbers matter. Leaders listen to numbers. Leaders, oh, you, that's the value of the, organ, of the community that you have? That's the value of the work? I didn't realize how huge that contribution was. So I share those numbers with you to not only encourage you and let you know that you have significant contribution, but so you can share those with other leaders. So other leaders can say, the community makes a huge difference. They know it, but when you can put a value on it, it makes a huge difference. So I use and encourage you, but I also want to make sure that you have these tools and resources, these numbers to share out in the community with leaders that you talk to, to go alongside the amazing stories of import and uh, success and transformation that you experience and promote. Um, what's interesting as well in a lot of what's happening in DC is something I'm personally excited about is how people are starting to understand how relationships matter too. So numbers matter the outcomes and the achievements that we see matter, but also relationships matter. A lot of this is being framed in terms of what we're calling social capital. Understanding how we make connections in these relationships and that these connections and relationships make a difference in programs and outcomes. Um, a lot of times we start with the framing of what's called uh, bridging, bonding, no, bonding, bridging, and linking capital. So understanding these are kind of critical. And it helps us think through some of the services that we need to provide in our community. Bonding is capital and relationships that are with like people. Other community and individuals who we know and are similar to us, and so we bond and connect with them because they're, they're similar to us. We share some experience. Oh, that happened to you too? It happened to me. And so now we have some bonding that's happening. We have some capital, some connection that's happening. But we also need systems and places in our community that form bridging capital that bring people together from different sectors and different places so that we can see and honor and respect and connect around some of those activities. But the other one that's really important is linking capital. And linking capital is, is opportunities that connect us to systems, connect us to nonprofits, connect us to federal agency or federal agencies, state agencies, local city agencies. And we need all these different pieces coming together to bring about outcomes. And what we're seeing and what we're looking at is when programs think through these relationships and these connections, we're seeing out, stronger outcomes achieved. Not only are you seeing stronger outcomes, I think we're also seeing sustained outcomes. So I'll give you one more example of this. We're seeing and looking at programs that have alumni networks. So when somebody uh, comes through the program um, and stays connected to that program, maybe even providing some support to people coming back through the program, the, 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 the maintaining of that relationship with the organization and the individual served actually leads to sustained outcome. And again, this is, this is capital. This is you managing that relationship and those dynamics so that you stay in touch with the program. And as you stay in touch with the program, you sustain the impact that was achieved when you are a participant in the program. And we're noting and celebrating programs that have alumni networks and asking how their alumni networks actually contribute to the program outcomes they're achieving. Um, there are other examples and programs that we're looking at, and we'll talk about those more as we look through some of the different issues. But I just wanted to make sure that you see that both you matter um, the, the community matters, the systems that we have matter, and then also that these relationships matter to the programs and outcomes we're trying to achieve. Okay, that's the first part. I think, I think I'm even, I'm good, okay. Um, I forgot to set my timer. I wanna hear from you all. What does that make you think? What are some of the things that you consider? What are some of the ways you see that expressed here in San Antonio? Help me, I love to tell, we were talking earlier, that you are experts in this room. I, I'm standing up here at front, but you are also experts. 
What are some of the things that you see? What are some of the examples that you've heard that connect to some of the things that I just shared? And uh, let's hear. Um, well, maybe you read over the weekend, but how Community Bible Church raised $75,000 worth of $20 gift cards for federal employees who had been furloughed locally. Isn't that amazing? That, that's a, for me, it's even an example of linking critical thinking and how we work together. Because if you didn't share the need, um, number one predictor of whether or not people volunteer is whether or not they're asked. If no one says we need gift cards, one way you could support people in need in our community is gift cards. Nobody gets asked, nobody does it because nobody asked, and then it doesn't happen. So we've got to help find ways to connect needs and opportunities, and that's that linking systems. Um, I was talking to Bill earlier today too. He said, you know, technology is sometimes communication is what we need, not technology. Technology can facilitate communication, but just talking is a form of technology, but ancient. <laughs> ancient technology, um, but we've used it. Why don't we use it a little bit more sometimes to get some of the things we need to do done? That's, again, a form of capital. But it also kind of rides on your whole thing about how numbers do matter. Mm -hmm. Because even if we say that numbers don't matter, to hear that $75,000 worth of $20 gift cards mm -hmm. to help the furloughed you know, federal employees, blah, 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 it makes a difference, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. We got one. OK. Um, I, I was thinking of that very same example, too, but because many, many times I have been really upset with government mm. that is supposed to be working to take care of the common good and does not. And who comes through? It, it's always the faith-based groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And the experience of this recent shutdown really pulled that whole thing together, I think. I saw it all over the place. And what it said to me was, you know, out of the awful stuff that happened to so many people, all of the pain that was there, the sense of solidarity that came through with every single group, you know, even to the uh, resource fair yesterday that was offered by the county with all the different organizations around. It just said immense things to me. But it said to me that people maybe who had never had that experience before of being at a loss with what was going on experienced what other people go through every single day. And they also experienced the compassion of people that they never expected it from. I just thought, something good. I'm really struck. It's so many pieces of this, so it's interesting. <laughs> um, I think we often see big problems, and we look to the biggest place for the solution, which many times is federal agencies, and I get those calls. <laughs> and, I, and I hear someone say, I have this huge problem in my community. How do I solve it? And so often my, t my answer is not that we have the answer. And actually, it's interesting here, too, because the answer that they're looking to is the people who were furloughed. So there's all this mix, right, of both value and challenge. And those individuals are providing significant service to their community, but not always the, are the solution in the community. They provide this kind of ongoing support and connection that we miss when we don't have it, but we don't often see. I, um, I'm reminded of sound men. We don't have a sound man up there right now. You don't know the sound man's not there until... There he is. He's up there. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Look, they say thank you. That's another person who we don't... Until it's not there, right? And so when we don't see these systems... And so I, I have noticed, at least when I experienced the shutdown a few years ago, there is about a four-month lag. Four months from now, we'll see the impact of people having not worked for 30 days because it takes that long for the system to come through. But often, the solutions in our communities are not coming from DC. They're not coming from the government. They are often small. They're little. They're asked that go out that say, hey, can you help with this? And people step up. People get involved. And many times, it's our faith community that are the ones who are equipped and able to step into these spaces and to f facilitate and meet need when they're asked um, if they know what the need is and can be resourced in that way. So, Love how there's so many different these pieces. So, but one thing I take away, many times big problems have small solutions. Many times big challenges that we face 
have, have things that, little smaller pieces that can be addressed to meet that need in meaningful and important ways that we can help identify and that many times faith and community leaders can contribute into. Other thoughts? Hi, good afternoon. Over here. Yes, yes. Um, I would like to mention my experience working in a social service field. Um, I'm glad to be here in San Antonio because the persons in general provide a great service. Uh, for example, many agencies, I can say 100%, but many agencies has bilingual service programs for the families mm -hmm. because San Antonio has a high percent for mm -hmm. Spanish families. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, many organizations provide another language services too. So this is great because our oh, population feel more comfortable mm -hmm. when they receive the service and the language that they use mm -hmm. Another I would like to share is how we like citizens, like persons, like residents, we support activities in the city. For example, in my personal experience, I participate on the Countless Homeless last week. Yeah. So it was a great experience because we was many, many organizations mm -hmm. Working together to count how many homeless we had in community. Mm -hmm. I was mentioned before, like after this count, these populations, we had hoping for help, and we had many other resources. I'm working for HESTA programs. I feel glad when the families approach me and they express some needs. I'm glad because I found in the community resources for this family. It's when you say, I'm here. So we connect, all the organizations connect, and we provide the service. It's true when you say it's in a high population service or small places like the churches in the community, community centers. But in San Antonio, uh, I trust really we provide a great service for the families, and we try to work together. It doesn't matter religion, doesn't matter income, doesn't matter another stuff. It's only the compassion one to another person over here. Awesome. Thank you, sir. No, I see that too, and I think that's why we're excited. I'm excited to be here with you all. Let me just respond to a few of those points. A faith leader once told me, and I love this, he was talking about Spanish language translation. He was saying that many of his communities speak both English and Spanish, but if he doesn't translate it into Spanish, the community doesn't use it because the community is bilingual. And his comment to me was, someone always pays the cost of complexity. And the question, one of the small pieces we can ask is how, and maybe one of the ways we can have the greatest impact without the, the, latest, the greatest negative impact is by saying how can we answer the cost of complexity? How can we translate things that otherwise wouldn't get translated? How can we kind of help put pieces together that other people won't put together because we are willing to take the time and the ability and build those relationships and connections that allow us to bring everybody together in meaningful and important ways to address all the different challenges that we're facing. So it's, it's gotta be, somebody always has to pay that cost. As a part of the solution that you're building, can you be the answer? Can you provide and address that complexity? Because often I think, here's the other thing, for vulnerable populations, we expect them to manage complexity. We expect them to figure out all the different services they need. We expect them to figure out the programs and activities. And if we can have, this is a lot of uh, interesting programs, uh, creating navigators, creating individual who manages the complexity of someone and says, I'm gonna walk this through with you. And again, we're back at relationships because if you don't have a helpful relationship with that person, that navigator can't really help that person walk through those challenges because you need the trust of somebody to be able to manage, just because you can't, you don't turn over your complex problems to just anybody, right? You turn them over to somebody you trust, you turn them over to somebody, and again, here too, um, community leaders, smaller nonprofits faith that, that are in proximity, that are close to individuals, many times can be some of those individuals who manage that complexity, who vulnerable populations will let manage that complexity. So it's a critical step. One more comment before we move on. Yeah. How does, how does uh, our <coughs> $1.2 trillion match up to the last several years or 20 years ago or 30 years ago? That's a great question. Um, the the $1.2 trillion from Faith Counts was a time point in time uh, study. Um, and the organization Faith Counts is actually looking at other ways to kind of parse that information and, and count some of those different. They don't have um, numbers from previous years. 
I think one of the things we're seeing, though, is that there are opportunities for us to look and value that in different ways in different places. Um, some communities are doing audits of their the, all the different contributions in the faith community and then doing a regular update of that so you can show the growth that's happened. Um, now, one thing I do know historically, and kind of we know this intuitively, but not, but but it's important. Historically, many faith communities contributed significantly to social spending, um, and so historically, there has been a lot of investment in this space. Um, we don't have good numbers, but here's another thing too that I would say: we need better numbers. We need to do a better job measuring what we do and the impact that we have because leaders are asking those types of questions that you're asking and we need to have better information. Now, at the same time, we need to have the strong relationships. We can't forget the relationship component that makes what so many programs do effective, but we've also got to have better numbers so that we can show the value in more places to more leaders about what is impacted and how it, how it has an impact. So it's got to be both and, not either or. Sometimes we can look at numbers and get so number focused that we forget that it's about people being served and lives being changed. But we also need the numbers. It's a, it's a, it goes hand in hand. And so, but I would say historically, we've done pretty good on the stories and the relationship side. We've not done as well as, the, as we need to do as organization civic sector on the numbers to show what the actual impact is on an ongoing basis. So we have like little ideas, but not big picture stories. And we need more big picture stories. I just want to add here, so make sure if you want to get the annual report from the faith-based initiative mm -hmm. that you've left your email address because we're going to send it out to all of you. But we've got some amazing numbers. 19 tons of brand new blankets and winter wear labeled, sized, bundled, were delivered by the Latter-day Saints last year after an urgent action alert. Also after some mapping and looking where the needs were in District 3, which is Southeast San Antonio, Four new food pantries opened, and now approximately 700 more families are being fed than a year ago. We got tons of numbers. So it's in that annual report, and if you want a copy of it, make sure we have your email address. Thank you, Ben. There's another great point as well, that, that, that with what you have within in the San Antonio uh, Compassionate Initiative, um, government agencies ha sometimes are better at some of those, those dot those number counting and processing and thinking through things and communities are better at serving and faith communities are better at doing certain parts and so how do we leverage all those different strengths unless we're in communication and talking with each other we don't so we've got to have that communication and collaboration which re honors and recognizes our respective strengths and leverages all of them to achieve the things that we're looking to achieve um, i want to spend some time talking about prevention because i think that's a really critical step um, on so many of these challenges, many of things we can, we can address need, but if we don't get at prevention, we're not getting ahead of the problem, we're kind of staying behind the eight ball, and we're getting stuck on some of these issues, and we're not actually getting to preventing the challenges that we experience. We've got to address need, but we really got to get ahead of challenges. Many times um, when we approach, there's an increasing amount of conversation around understanding and recognizing trauma. Um, when we talk, I, I'm using this frame, and I think we talked about our vulnerable populations. This is any population, any of the populations that need help and support are many times experiencing some level of vulnerability. Um, when we think about and how to serve vulnerable populations, many times these populations have experienced adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, um, a form of trauma, maybe they, beyond ACEs to other forms of trauma. And until we understand those levels of trauma and we ask instead of what's wrong with you to what happened to you, what are some of the experiences? I think through compassion. Compassion for me connects to empathy and empathy looks at the world through the eyes of someone else. Empathy asks, what did you experience and how can I better understand some of those experiences and challenges and how does that relate to the services? How does that relate to prevention? How does that relate to just me talking to you about the challenges you're facing? If you've experienced trauma, you may um, be struggling with that before I actually work through the, the problem that you're facing. Maybe the thing that's creating or contributing to your vulnerability relates to some of those challenges you experienced. And if I'm not as a, as a person here too, holding some of that complexity that you might experience, holding some of those challenges, being empathetic to some of those considerations, having compassion for you within that situation, the service that we deliver may not be as effective. 
And so approaching things from a trauma-informed perspective, better understanding trauma, better understanding ACEs can be a significant step that you can take no matter who and how you're serving. Um, if you are approaching uh, populations in need who are experiencing hunger and the family's experienced hunger, you may need to think about whether or not this family has experienced some level of trauma as it relates to. I mean, not having food and not knowing if you're going to have food and the malnourishment that it can be experienced can be a form of, of not thinking I'm ever going to have anything. If you can't have food, then what else can you not have? If I approach that circumstance and that situation, that vulnerable population that I'm working with from that perspective, significant changes, different ways of approaching populations can happen, which can really make a difference for how you serve and support that population. And let me say that too, this is a critical step, that prevention can not just be like a service delivery, but just a connection and a communication, an involvement, a participation in a community that says you're welcome uh, on the weekend service just as much as you're involved in the program Monday through Wednesday, Monday through Friday, depending on your service delivery. Um, and so you got to think through those different pieces and considerations as you think through how to serve in the community. But it's that both that service and participation, that involvement and that connection. Um, one thing, I love this quote from a faith leader, his name's Ed Setzer. He says, um, faith communities without the broken are also broken. If our faith communities aren't places where it can welcome people who've experienced trauma and, and challenged with trauma and are welcoming into that environment, then there's a brokenness that's there already that we need to wrestle with and experience. But then we also need to think about how we include those individuals who've experienced brokenness and trauma and think about how to connect to those services. Um, so there are bodies of work, there are work uh, activities, whole policy spaces that are getting ahead of this. We're, we're talking about social capital. There's also the work in what's called Families First, um, which is a whole reframe of the child welfare system, saying that instead of just responding to child welfare cases, we should actually making, make it so that there are fewer child welfare cases in the first place. Um, some work that was done, um, actually in some analytical work, they found that they could actually predict where child welfare cases occurred. And they um, were using data in the community. My ex the exciting thing that happened here is that the researcher who's doing this work, she didn't take it to the county, she didn't take it to the other places, she took it to faith communities. And she said, if you could know where a child welfare case actually happened, would you do something in that community? Would you serve? Would you support? Would you build up connections and relationships in this block where a, a child may be separ become separated from their family? And kind of faith leaders are like, of course. If I can actually help a family from, from being separated, that's something I want to work toward. And it was this motivation that these faith communities needed to actually jump into that space and jump into those communities and really see significant change happen. But it's interesting, it's hard to measure, we're talking about measurement, it's hard to measure something that has not happened. It's hard to measure something that you, by your work, won't see happen as a result. But it can be, it's a question of how do we put these pieces together of, of uh, programs and activities because well, that's what we want. Human flourishing in our communities is about not seeing families broken up. It's about not seeing kids who are experiencing hunger. It's about families who are at risk of being homeless staying in their home and being supported. But we've got to think about how we get ahead of these challenges and how all our excuse me, different organizations and communities can participate in those systems. And lastly, let me say before we turn it over to some more conversation and dialogue. Um, we talked in uh, compassion about being compassionate to self. And I would be remiss if I didn't encourage us and challenge us to say that we have to take care of ourselves just as much or maybe even more than we take care of those in our community. Um, we have to recognize that we need to do self-care and take care of ourselves so that we can care for others as well. Um, I, um, I'm reminded of this when I went to a community affected by uh, Hurricane Florence. And my word to them was, as you are building other people's homes up, as you are building your home back up, ask the question, am I okay? Just as much as you're asking of all the people in the community that you're serving, are you okay as well? Um, it's such a critical step that we need to make sure that as caregivers, we do the work of ourselves to care for ourselves and to make sure that we um, have that reservoir built up within ourselves so that we can serve others as well. Um, I think so many times, and actually I may say this too, when we look through and think about how we can serve others in the community, it can get overwhelming sometimes. 
It, we can see, again, big problems, complex problems. My experience is that when we do better with self-care, we have more of a reserve to serve, and we have a little bit more measure of ability to manage some of those big challenges that we see, and we have a little bit more space to identify those small solutions because we're not becoming overwhelmed by the, the hugeness of the problem because we're taking care of ourselves, and we have a little bit more to contribute into these circumstances. So um, as a part of prevention, prevention is not just a big system thing, it's not just a national thing, it's not just a statewide or a city thing, it's a personal thing. We've gotta be doing our own work to make sure that we get ahead of the challenges and take care of ourselves just as much as we take care of others. So it's a reminder, I think it's a mental health reminder, it's a care reminder, it's a support reminder, just to think about how those things connect to the work that you're doing as well. So, I was telling somebody, I once started a workshop um, in a community with about 20 leaders and I didn't talk for the first 10 minutes. I was just like, hi. And my point was to emphasize that you all are the experts. You all know what's happening in the community. I see these big pictures, but you see what this means for individuals on the ground in your community. So I wanna hear that expertise that you guys have, that richness, that understanding that's expressed, and connect. What does this mean for you? How do you see what this works? Maybe you're doing some work and this makes sense, and you're connecting to some of these conversations saying, wow, I wonder how this works with my community. I wonder how trauma is something I need to think about more. So, the floor is yours. Let's hear your ideas and perspectives about how some of this works. I'm with uh, Mission Presbyterian. I'm the Disaster Recovery Coordinator Wonderful. and work with and through Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. And prevention is one of the biggest things we're working on right now because um, I lived in Florida for 30 years mm -hmm. where prevention is a huge thing when it comes to hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And as I've discovered, I have a 66 county area here in the state. And what I've discovered is preparations in the state of Texas are abysmal. Mm. You don't hear about needing to prepare for a hurricane except in a few locations. Mm. You don't hear about being prepared for the next flood. Now you hear about, you know, don't go into the water and drown, but how do you prepare to avert the next flood? What do you need to do to your property to be prepared? What do you need to do to be prepared for the next fire? Mm -hmm. What do you need to do to be prepared for the next tornado? What do you need to do for the next man-made disaster? And, and really trying to get people to think in the term of preparedness is something that I think every community has to think about. And, you need, and we need to be targeting that mm -hmm. because if people are more prepared, there's less chance of casualties. When the, some re, there's some research around resilience. Is anybody familiar with the term resilience? Uh, this idea that, that when we have lot more connections, we are better prepared or more connected. Actually, communities that have higher levels of connectedness and resilience actually recover faster from disasters. Um, and so through the connections and the resources and the conversations that we're building, we are not only having an impact now, we're having an impact when future challenges come down the road, we have, we're having an impact. But let me say this, I think this is such a critical point. We also need to think about preparedness in our minority communities and our underserved communities. Um, we've seen that time and time again, and I think uniquely faith communities have a specific opportunity in these spaces to build some of these relationships and connections, and then again, contribute to and have a contribution to our ongoing health, because resilient communities are healthy communities as well, so. Opportunity to connect to that. It also makes me think, so I'm just going to keep like harvesting as well. <laughs> um, I'm curious how many folks know about volunteers organize something disaster, VOAD, mm -hmm. and the emergency system that we do have here. I think what I'll do is I'll send out the information along with the annual report. Those are like weekly meetings, always preparing for what's coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our urgent action alert system as well. And Ben, you might not know this, um, but so much of who we are in terms of disaster, in terms of poverty, I mean, we can measure the whole thing, is San Antonio's literal geography. Hmm. And so where there are floodplains, I mean, well, you can look at our geography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so Kristen Drennan um, from Trinity University has done extensive studies on our geography and how it impacts um, our community concerns. And she presented at one of our gatherings before. We have her on Nowcast and online. So we'll send out that link as well. So if you're not familiar with all those numbers and that data about what's happening because of our literal geography and topography, and I'll send that in there as well. So you're gonna get a lot of stuff in it. Think too about how geography relates to bridging and bonding capital. It can help connect people who are already connected. Many times they connect in certain communities, but then if we are able to bridge some of those connections, again, we're back to resilience. We're back to talking about how we build systems that address vulnerable populations in meaningful and important ways. When we think about connecting across the usual systems and places where we connect. So real huge opportunity to do work in that space. Thank you for that comment. Yeah. Share your name too. I haven't made sure we Thank do that. Yeah. Thank you. What is your name, by the way? Ben. Mr. Odell. Ben. Yes. Um, my name is Nora Gonzalez. I do work for Metro Health. I'm a community health worker awesome. in the Highland Park area. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you because the things that you're sharing are amazing. I'm sitting here just like super excited because um, this is what we, we learn in the community. Um, in, in the health department, um, Dr. Bridger does push the ACEs on us. I mean, that's like the thing that we're really um, working towards this year. Amazing, amazing stuff. Sometimes I'm like, what? That's like common sense. Hello. Right? <laughs> Dumb moment. Yeah. yeah. But... Um, <laughs> But I appreciate you bringing it up because um, I think sometimes, you know, and, and I'm sorry, I'm just too excited with you. <laughs> um, especially when we, when we are privileged enough to have a role where we're able to look at systems or problems, we think we're the experts and it's like, you said it, you gotta fix yourself first, you know? When I learned about ACEs, I had to take that test for myself and be like, whoa, my ACEs are pretty high, you know? And the thing is that, Everything that I learn, I have to take it back to my family and try it with my family first, you know? Anything that I'm gonna take out into the community, I have to try it in my home base, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times um, when, when uh, working with a faith-based community, um, you see people that are in leadership who don't even speak to their family members but then you're trying to fix problems in the community, hold on, back it up. <laughs> hold on, let's take a couple of steps back mm -hmm. and let's try it out in our home and then we take it out. Mm -hmm. And I promise you, it works a hundred times better. Mm -hmm. um, I am very privileged that I, I do have a good relationship um, with Baptist Temple, they're right here in the front. Mm -hmm. um, and we work together closely, but we have, I feel, and, and I hope that they feel the same way too, <laughs> that we have such a close relationship that we're able to like call each other out when, when we're kind of struggling on an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that everybody really needs to think about. Uh, if you don't know about ACEs, we do teach on it. We give presentations, but there's a lot of people who are picking it up and that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that just speaking from um, a personal level, my, my life right now is, I wanna say amazing, mm -hmm. amazing. Like the, the flow in my home is amazing. It's taken me three years to get there, mm -hmm. but everything that I learn, I try it on my home base first. Mm -hmm. So thank you for expressing that because that's yeah. super important yeah. to say me first, mm -hmm. then I can give you some. And now I know how to navigate it, mm -hmm. not go out there and be like, let me fix your problem because it's not <laughs> realistic. So thank you, Mr. Ben, I appreciate thank it. Thank you, yes, Nora, I appreciate it. No, I think it's so many great pieces of what you're talking about and sharing. Um, note that there are trainings on ACEs that other leaders can take and connect to and, and learn more about this kind of space, such a critical space, really contributing to a lot of learning in other s sectors, um, substance use, um, to people struggling with addiction. Individuals who have high, higher numbers of ACEs are at higher risk of experiencing addiction. Um, uh, so many different components and considerations that we need to think about in this space. Um, and also this affirmation that we need to do it ourselves. We, we can't go out and tell the community that they're working on a problem that I'm not willing to work on myself. Um, and it's just, oh, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. More, more. It makes me think too of the, so I only know this one number, one in five in a congregation, you know, are impacted in one way or another by mental illness. Mm -hmm. And um, they tend to go to their faith leadership first mm -hmm. before anyone else. I'm wondering, and I'm looking here at Terry from NAMI and Doug, who's 
lead the action team on mental health wellness uh, in the initiative. Is there a number like that, but among like leadership? What, what's that number sound like? Well, I've been, among I've, faith leaders or leaders in general who suffer? There's at least one study of faith leaders in, of Methodist leaders in North Carolina. It's called the Methodist, uh, Methodist the Duke Methodist Leadership Study that did find that there are increasingly high numbers of individuals experiencing both suicidality and uh, mental health concerns as a part of clergy, at least in the Methodist Church in that space. Um, we don't have a firm number nationally, but it means certainly there is an increased amount of attention specifically on suicidality, um, of a risk of suicidality among clergy. Um, as they, and again too, we're back at self-care. You know, we're back at this consideration that they are, they are carrying so many of those hurts and pains in the community. And if the work, if as clergy leaders, if clergy leaders aren't doing the work of self-care, then it becomes overwhelming to carry all those concerns across the community. So um, really important for us to be looking at both those components. Yeah, no, simply the comment is just um, the sense of uh, non-anxious presence, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of just that, and then uh, the idea of just Sabbath, you know, just that rest. So how, how would um, leaders really just model that, mm -hmm. you know, and relax in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, self-care looks like lots of different things. Sometimes it's just taking a break. Um, sometimes it, it is that calm presence and peace um, that can be presented and finding that peace and place for yourself and doing that compassion work. But yeah, and this is critically important in the mental health space. I want to talk about that in our, our second kind of session about the critical importance of mental health um, that you guys are also addressing here too. Um, but we're going to think about some of those connections and, and uh, possibilities that are present. Other thoughts about prevention, uh, self-care, and how we have to take care of ourselves as a part of the work we do in our community. Bill's on his way to somebody else, but we'll come back over here. Ken Donahue over there. Bill, Bill did self-care by taking a loop around the room here for a second. <laughs> He's getting his steps in. There you go, exactly. His steps in, everybody needs to get how many steps? 10,000? <laughs> I, I don't know where that number came from. Uh, anyway, uh, what I've recognized is that uh, I think we need to be open uh, to other organizations that uh, are doing preventative things. Mm. Uh, and I've come across, uh, other than a faith-based organization, I've come across this uh, other organization that is beginning to develop the numbers that you're uh, mm. looking for in terms of uh, preventive uh, prevention of suicide, prevention mm -hmm. of divorce, uh, through a particular system mm -hmm. that is being offered to military and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, both active uh, vets and, uh, and families. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think we need to be open to that and, and tie in those connections with our faith-based organizations as well. And by the way, I'm Ken Donahue, as Dan said. <laughs> what, what's the name of that organization, Ken? Uh, it goes by an acronym. Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> it's called uh, TADSAW, T-A-D-S-A-W. And it is a, it's a program of providing service dogs to, uh, to uh, veterans uh, in particular that uh, are experiencing uh, PSTD and, and other anxiety uh, uh, maladies, mm -hmm. uh, and and they actually have uh, develop, begin to, begun to develop numbers mm -hmm. uh, related to the preventive aspects of this particular mm -hmm. program, awesome. and I'll get you the literature yeah. in. I'm, and we'll send it out to everybody. I'm familiar with the project na or name pro organization called, I think it's Project Reboot, if I remember correctly. Um, Two really cool things about what they're doing. Um, one is that they are addressing trauma in service members, um, but they address trauma in service members through um, group work. They basically bring the group together and they encourage them to relate to each other. And in many ways, that service dog connection where you're building that relationship, they basically use other people 
as those relationships and connections, and, and they have a faith component. I love the director of this program said, I'm too faith-based for the science folks, and I'm too science-based for the faith-based folks, because um, he's really bringing all these pieces together to show how you can have an impact when you think about trauma, when you think about relationships, and address populations in need. Let me speak to one other component that you shared, and I think this is really critical. Um, you know, sometimes when we're working with more conservative organizations, more organizations that aren't as comfortable with coming on my space and working together, and, or, and I describe to people like this as a, as a collaboration, kind of sometimes collaboration is these overlapping circles, and somebody's like, no, don't come into my space. That's my space. No, 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 no. That's not an opportunity to stop. That's not an opportunity to say, oh, no, I'm not going to work with them. I always challenge people to think not just about collaboration, but complementing. Complementing says, so here's a circle. I've got a weakness. You've got a strength. I'm going to complement. I'm going to come alongside. It's like a puzzle piece coming together rather than circles overlapping. And when we think about how we can complement each other, first, I think, you, as you noted, you have to recognize I have a weakness. I have a piece of this puzzle that I don't have. I have a piece of this that somebody can come in and someone else has a strength that fits into my weakness. Someone else has an expertise in prevention. Someone else has an, uh, an expertise in something that I don't have an expertise in as a faith community, as a community-based organization. And if we think about how we can fit our resources together, we can be an expression of a greater whole, a better understanding of the puzzle than if we only said, oh, nope, <laughs> this puzzle piece doesn't go with this couple piece, I'm not talking to you. Um, or just not even asking whether or not we fit together which happens more often than not. Um, we've got to really do the wrestling and the thinking through of how the pieces fit, where my strengths relate to your weaknesses and vice versa, so that we can think about how we have a greater system of care for those who are struggling in our community. So complement over collaboration. Back here in the back. Hi, I'm Trish Moy with Habitat for Humanity. Hi, um, you just made me think of um, one of the populations that we're currently serving a lot of families with is the former refugees from Burma and Myanmar. Mm. Um, they have uh, come in uh, from the refugee camps. Many of them grew up there their whole lives. Uh, they've come into the country through Catholic Charities. Mm. Um, Catholic Charities has worked with them and gotten them connected in communities. And um, then they get employment and then they, some of them, move on to a connection with uh, Trinity Baptist Church. And Trinity Baptist Church continues to connect them and, and foster that. And then they come through us and we teach them, you know, all about uh, home ownership and um, they build their home right with mm -hmm. us. And, and then they continue to help others that come in and serve them as, as translators or, or putting hours on their houses uh, so they get mm -hmm. built as well. So that's, that's a great example of the puzzle pieces that you're talking mm -hmm. about where um, multiple organizations of faith are, are serving these, these populations to get them successful and independent mm -hmm. so they can serve themselves and they can continue to serve others and the mm -hmm. cycle can grow. Yeah. Um, our ref refugee populations and the work that we can do in that space is such a critical need. Thinking about, again, the, sometimes um, when we think about how to serve in our community, if we think about how to serve the most vulnerable, if we think about how to serve those people who are struggling the most, the systems that we need, again, we're back to resilience, as we build those connections and relationships, so we actually will serve others who are less vulnerable in the community because we've created a system that will address a kind of a safety net that will catch those who struggle the most at the, with the greatest number of challenges. Think about those as a refugee, someone who's coming to the country, may not have connections and relationships, may not speak the language, may not have some of those connections and resources. If we think about how to serve and to meet that level of vulnerability, all the other populations that experience parts of that vulnerability can be served by a system that addresses the most vulnerable. And so as we think about how to create systems of care, as we think about how our puzzle pieces work together, if we can be strategic in how we think about the most vulnerable, we can often create a system that will care for all vulnerable populations in our community in meaningful and important ways. Now, it's not gonna take away vulnerability. It's not going to take away need, but it can create systems through which those individuals can move through to affect change. And I think that's just an opportunity for us to think about as we create systems of care. So how, yes, how is that being understood that through collaboration and complementing that you're actually, uh, I guess what I'm capturing for what you're saying, you're actually doing 
heavy lifting. So, so right, in other words, if you're getting to the most vulnerable, and you're actually capturing Great point. Abel's kind of saying, so how does that work? Where does it go? Or, 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 or the sense that um, you would recognize that in the collective. Yeah. I guess it seems that would spur on. I would hope so. And I think we're certainly seeing places that have comprehensive ways of meeting need that they are more effective in serving the populations that they serve. One of the ways this is getting expressed is something called social determinants of health. Uh, Secretary Azar just recently gave a speech talking about how as we address social determinants of health, and I'll talk about what that is in a second, um, that we have better systems of care. Um, so really, let me uh, use an example. Um, if someone comes into the emergency room and is sick, um, and we don't think about where their next meal is going to come from, they're going to come back to the emergency room because they didn't have their next meal planned. They come in for malnourishment and we don't think about how they're going to get healthy food, then they're going to come back to the emergency room malnourished. And so if we're not thinking about how we provide systems of, of and prescribing healthy food and prescribing like systems of care and letting them know where their SNAP benefit is, letting them know where a local food bank is, um, if we don't help them connect to that service, they're going to continue to be sick because even though malnourishment, the medical symptom, there's what they're coming in for, hunger is the challenge. And if we don't think about the, I mean, hunger, um, uh, living situation, we talked about housing, um, you can talk about um, care in the family and support, connect, social connections as a form of uh, social determinants of health. If we don't think about all those other pieces, then we won't have healthy people. We won't have human flourishing. Um, let me say this too, interesting and important. Um, Center for Human Flourishing found that religion can be a significant factor in promoting health and wellness. The social connections, the sense of purpose and identity that comes from our faith communities can be a huge contributor to outcomes that we're looking for in populations. And so, uh, you know, as you're thinking, you know, just saying, hey, I want to encourage you to participate in a community, wherever that community is. It can be Rotary. It can be the YMCA. We're seeing um, an organization called Phoenix Multisport. Does anybody know about Phoenix Multisport? It's a gem for individuals struggling with addiction. And they go, they do their workout, and they talk about how they struggle with addiction. They find community and support, and they actually maintain their um, health, and they get healthier because they're working out. <laughs> like, again, aha moment is a dumb moment in disguise. Um, you know, it's, it's that you could be prescribed a gym. You know, people talk about CrossFit as this place where people have this connection that they don't have any other place. CrossFit can be something that you might need to help contribute to your health outcomes. CrossFit may be something that someone who's trying, sort of where some, a refugee would say, ah, this is great. I have this place where I can go and work out and do all these things, and then I'm more equipped to do all the other things I need to do. We need to find and encourage those levels of connection and places of connection. Again, social capital, relationship building. Uh, relationships matter for the outcomes that we're looking to try and achieve. So um, also, in, I mean, this has been my time in federal government. I don't think I've seen a grant opportunity where it says, oh, apply for this grant and you can do it alone. Just go ahead, you know, just don't tell us about anyone you're working with. That's not important at all. No, almost every grant encourages you and gives you points about whether or not you say you have memorandums of understanding, MOUs, for partnerships that you have in the community because we know that you need partnerships. There are even um, steps that are being taken in certain grant programs where if you say, um, we're going to address this, and the population in greatest of need is this population in my community. But if you don't have a partnership with someone in that community, they come back to you and you say, okay, to get this grant, you actually need a partnership to work with the population that is most in need, that you said is most in need in your grant application. I'm going to keep saying it. Aha moment is a dumb moment in disguise. Um, it's this realization that as a part of your grant, you actually need partners who work with the community that you need to serve. And again, here we're back at faith communities, we're back at community-based institutions who have those relationships that can contribute into outcomes that we're looking to achieve in these programs and pro activities. So, yeah. I mean, I think connectionality is great, and I think that's one of the things we have to do. But also, having come from the corporate world, uh, we also need to be able to share the data. Mm. And, and who you're working with and sharing with, because... I might have something that somebody else needs, 
and we're servicing the same community. Mm -hmm. But if we're not sharing our data, we don't know who's doing what for whom mm -hmm. or with whom. Mm -hmm. And we could find a lot of people who aren't being served. And on the opposite hand, we might find people who are double dipping. Yeah. Could, I, could I take you one step further? Sure. I think we don't need to just share data. I think we need to share success. Yes. We need to be saying, hey, we did this together. I didn't do it. You know, no, nobody ever says you did it. Um, you know, but we need to stay together and we need to celebrate success. So not just do we need to collect data and share data and bring all these systems together, but then we need to find opportunities to say, yay, we did this and we couldn't do it alone. And so if we, I think when you share success, you have more reason to share more data. You have more opportunities to build more relationship and greater things are possible when you put some of these pieces together. So I just wanna encourage you not only to share data, but also to revel in success. But here's two, let's say this. We need a greater system and an honor of the system, and that means we need to revel in each other's success. So not just share success, but then also say this organization, our community did this, and it was amazing that they did that. And we want to lift that up in our newsletter, not about us, but to say this other organization did great stuff. <laughs> Nora likes that idea. Um, so think about how we can, we can, yeah, not just share success, but also honor each other's successes. Yeah. I, I want to speak to that. Hello, everybody. <laughs> this is so cool that the people of faith are here to mobilize within our communities. And I, I personally live by a quote that Mother Teresa said, and I think it might be appropriate to share uh, she said, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten we belong to one another. Mm. So this time is, is appropriate that we think about how we belong to one another in extending compassion within our community. But I wanted to piggyback off of uh, sharing successes. Our church, uh, we have a church, Bethel International Christian Fellowship, uh, and in 2006, we started the Bethel uh, Community Development Corporation. And since then, even prior to establishing that, so that we could tap into federal funding for work that we had already been doing within our community. But one of the uh, most successful things that we did uh, talking about sharing was we, instead of having our usual Sunday worship service, we did two services. One where we had a panel discussion for those who were suffering with HIV and AIDS. We talked about those who had succumbed, those who had gotten infected. Uh, we did some conversation on sexual health. Uh, to encourage uh, various types of condom use that I didn't even have a clue about until I went through some Hamasa training and various trainings. And when they found out, they're like, what are you doing in here, Pastor? You know, what, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying to take care of people suffering in the community that other people have forgotten about. And we collaborated with uh, Beat Aid, San Antonio uh, AIDS Foundation, and other people who could come and, and awaken people's uh, soul that we are responsible for the burdens that people are carrying in our community. And then the last thing that we did last year, we didn't have a church service. We had a panel discussion on alcoholism and opioid addiction. And we found out within our congregation, as quiet as it had been kept, many of our congregants were suffering with opioid addiction, were too shamed to hit the altar for prayer. And that prayer is good. I believe in it. I've seen miracles. But we need to be able to direct persons and people without shame in the game. Can you write that down? Yeah, without shame, shame in the game. game to organizations within the community that can help them outside of what we're able to do in providing that faithful uh, support. And the members loved it. They're like, what's the next thing we're going to do to shut down the regular worship service? <laughs> So the next thing that I'm working on for April, since April is Sexual Assault Month, 
A lot of women I have found through our women's fellowship have been sexually assaulted. My niece, unfortunately, I don't know if you all are familiar with the R. Kelly drama that's been going on. My niece got picked up here in the city by him as a young teenage girl and got caught up in the fiasco of that. So we're gonna do a crucial conversation on substance abuse, sexual assault, and trauma. And that is how we do exactly what you're talking about doing. So thank you for coming. Thank you. You're such a smart lady. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for doing thank this. You, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I thought you. it was important. I didn't pay her, but she gave me my transition. Oh, okay. I'll, no, no. But we we'll got go, a couple we'll more coming here. Okay. What you're doing is redefining the word service. There you go. I think yeah. he's going to somebody. So right here? Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Susan, and I'm with Compassionate San Antonio. I'm not with the city part of it. I'm with the not-for-profit part of it that came out of the Peace Center. But when you talked about celebrating success, we're doing that here. And let me tell you about it, because everybody can be a part of it. Um, when this city council and this mayor first took over June, almost two years ago now, we became a compassionate city on that day. Mm. And a month later, we said, the compassion is in the stories. It's in the numbers, but it's in the stories. And we keep telling the stories and then losing them. So let's start capturing them. So what I do is every day I go through all of the newspapers, all of the television programs, every newsletter from every organization I get. And we tweet every compassionate act we find mm. to lift up the organizations that are doing that work. Um, so yeah. we've been doing that <laughs> now for, it's almost 80 weeks. Hmm. Um, I'd have to look it up. And we're just approaching 2,000 compassionate acts. Mm. And sometimes it's little things like neighbors putting together a barbecue fundraiser for mm. a kid in the neighborhood who has cancer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's huge things that affect the entire city mm -hmm. and are very systemic, a change mm -hmm. to the way that we do things. Sometimes it's about faith-based organizations. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's about nonprofit organizations. A lot of times it's just about individuals mm -hmm. doing good things. And more and more it's about our city doing compassionate acts. So you can look for that if you're on Twitter at CompassionNet one, the number one, and we're there on Twitter and you can find us. And on our website, which is sacompassion.net, I do a weekly news roundup, so you can get it that way every week. And if Ann, you could put that out, those um, two addresses. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's um, because we're doing that and it's, it's stunning mm -hmm. how many organizations I've never heard of mm -hmm. are doing absolutely admirable, remarkable, amazing things mm -hmm. within our city. I get tired of writing about the food bank sometimes mm -hmm. <laughs> and habitat. <laughs> microphone, by the way. Ah, there it is. Yeah. But then sometimes they're, they're just these new organizations or organizations who have been doing it for 30 years mm -hmm. um, that we've never heard of. And so. just celebrating. Like and you just said, celebrating, celebrating the fact that there are good do. things being done. No, I think, so. and I want to say here, I'm here because I've heard about the good things that are going on and, and excited to participate and support the work you guys are doing in these meaningful and important ways. So I'm just, I'm honored to be here with you all in the work that you're doing, so. Yes. Yes, um, Mario, San Antonio Food Bank. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> good timing, good time. There you go. But no, thank you, I really just comment. Just wanna thank you for, for making the time to come down to San Antonio and to work with Ann at, at Human Services. You know, when you talk about faith-based initiative and compassion, you know, the food bank, we're just very uh, humbled and privileged and honored really to be able to serve with a lot of organizations in our footprint that we cover. Um, the majority are faith-based, you know, food pantries located at a church. Mm -hmm. And so with respect to the, the work that Ann is doing at Human Services and even Metro Health, we, we partner up with City Council District 3 and other the, the, the council districts and the mayor's office just to be able to provide that service and that mission of fighting hunger and feeding hope. Mm -hmm. When you talk about prevention, natural disaster, man-made disaster, I mean, you see 
there's 200 food banks across the country, 21 in the state of Texas, and we're all doing what we can do, but we couldn't do it without all of y'all, without the community, without partnering up. And so really just want to say thank you again for taking time to come down here and to speak to us. Yeah. And, and thank you to Ann for putting this on. Any By the way, as of yesterday morning, he wasn't coming. <laughs> It's that furlough thing. Uh, yeah, so they, they oh, did the me. whole three-week pause just yeah. for us on yeah. Friday so he, Ben could come <laughs> on Monday or Tuesday. Yeah, exactly. No, I was, I was like, can I go? Can I go? I really want to go. Otherwise, it'd be this disembodied picture of a screen up here. Wouldn't it be as fun? Um, I want to use the transition of what we've talked about and the, to really focus on some issues. Spend some time in the issues that you all are focused on. Spend some time on the issues that we're focused on nationally um, so that you can hear about some of those key strategies and activities um, and think through some of those components. Um, and then uh, we have the areas of community concern that are happening here. So I want to be available for you all to say, who's doing work on generational poverty? Who's doing work on homelessness? What are some of the strategies? And uh, I joked with, uh, with Anne, I'm gonna call that the mind, my mind game, uh, because there's just all these examples running around in my head, and you just have to help me pull them out. Um, so, and if not, if you are, if there's someone I don't know about, I'll go back and look, and we'll have conversations, and I'll follow up and send Ann and send you examples. So, the two things that we're really focused on in the Center for Faith and Opportunity initiatives are the opioid crisis and just the struggle that people are having with addiction, as well as mental health. Those are the two key issue areas that we've focused on. But our solution to the opioid crisis wasn't by us staying in DC and telling everybody this is what you need to do and here's the solution that you need to implement in your community. What we really did first, um, we just wanted to educate. We wanted to help people know what the opioid crisis was, where it came from, what are some of the challenges. What do you need to know about addiction that you might not know about otherwise? Um, and so what we did was we did a webinar series. We just brought the expertise of the government, all the leaders who are experts on the opioid crisis, the experts, I, I love this fact, um, the experts in HHS on opioid crisis come from the CDC Injury Center. Anyone know why the CDC Injury Center is the center of a lot of the opioid work? Because people who experience injuries have pain. People who have pain get painkillers. Opioids are painkillers. They were the ones who knew and even were working on some of these issues before it ever became this national consideration that we needed to think about with the opioid crisis. And so we had leaders from the CDC Injury Center come on and talk to people about why they were having, why we're having this moment, this challenge where we're losing 130 people a day to overdose deaths. Um, why, this is crazy too, we're seeing a shift that's happening where increasingly um, drug dealers are pushing meth as opposed to opioids because they're realizing that they're killing their clientele. Realtors are getting involved. Do you know why realtors need to get involved in the opioid crisis? Who, who knows? Dr. Kelly, do you want to tell us why? Well, because people who have an addiction will go and act like they're looking at a house, but their intention and true motive is to get into the restroom and get in the medicine cabinet and steal prescriptions that have not been used, uh, unused prescriptions. There, so we need realtors involved in the opioid crisis. We need 30% um, of all youth exposure to opioids comes through a dentist. Opioid, or Tylenol 3 has an opioid in it, and many times when you experience general teeth pain or after you get a, you know, a teeth work done, you get prescribed a low-dose opioid painkiller, and if you're not ready and you don't know that it has an addictive component, then this may be something that takes you down the road towards addiction that starts with that. Um, pain, or, uh, youth experiencing uh, doing sports, um, who have a sports injury, get prescribed a painkiller, and it's the kind of start of something that's larger and, and more challenging in their life that otherwise that wouldn't have happened had they not known that the opioid was an addictive, had an addictive component to it. Um, these are all things that we heard from CDC and heard from leaders across the country. And then um, we also went out and listened. And maybe I would say that's another component of what we can do in our communities is just hear what's already working, celebrate existing successes, 
And then what we did was we put those all together in what we call our practical toolkit. I, said, I, I was personally, I put practical on here because I said I couldn't do another toolkit. It had to be something that actually people could do. Um, and it's simple things. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier about just the act of um, including individuals who struggle with addiction as a part of your prayer time, putting them on the prayer list in the bulletin. And what happens when you start talking about people who struggle with addiction, suddenly you didn't even know people who had struggle with addiction or had family members who struggle with addiction. It's, it's safe. It's open, it's on the table, and now we can talk about it. We can bring you those concerns and considerations because we've made it a part of the conversation in our community and we said it's okay for us to talk about this level of brokenness in our space. Um, but then there's, there's more robust ways. I mean, that's just like a first step. You can become someone who can administer naloxone in your community. The Surgeon General has recommended that basically everyone be able to have naloxone, food pantries, um, community-based institutions, just if they are more places where naloxone is, a, is available, a drug that reverses the effects of an overdose death, they, they call it, some people call it the Lazarus drug because people are, are yeah, resurrected um, after they look like they were going to pass away. Um, and this, again, you can not just be life-giving, you can bring life into your community as someone who can administer naloxone after you've been trained on how to do that. Um, but then it's as well as, as we get ahead of the, um, as we get ahead of people dying, again, 130 people dying a day, that's why we have this national crisis and a focus on it. Once we get ahead of that, if we're going to actually help reduce addiction, help reduce the challenges, we've actually got to get ahead of the problem, not stay behind the problem. Um, and so what we need to do is create systems and opportunities to prevent addiction. We need to, again, ACEs is a part of this, knowing that producing or addressing ACEs can help reduce addiction or being at risk of addiction. There are ways that you can collaborate and connect and partner. Um, we're right now building out a process by which we help people know how to do workforce. Individuals who previously struggled with addiction need jobs just like everybody else. And then thinking through how you educate employers to work with somebody who experienced addiction, who, um, I love this point that people who experience addiction, um, for people who experience addiction, that relapse is a symptom of recovery. And again, now we have to think differently about addiction in our communities because we're thinking about how it's something that happens as a part of getting better. It's a part of like working through that challenge. They're working on it, but it's not to mean that we can't say that when you relapse, you failed or you're not working on your recovery anymore. No, it's just a part of getting better. And how can workforces be places that are working with individuals who are struggling with that and think through how they continue to employ those individuals who might be struggling? Um, but then also, um, you know, um, just thinking about different ways and partnerships, relationships that you can build in your community to strengthen those systems of care. Um, these are all strategies and activities that we outline in this toolkit. Um, and we actually highlighted the communities and the organizations across the country who are doing this work, and you can watch and listen to those webinars as well. Um, we also continue to advocate and challenge the system to partner with faith-based and community-based partners to address this opioid crisis. And we just heard from senior leadership at a meeting yesterday saying that, you know, as much as we invest money in our communities and address the challenges, we really need to see community leaders step up into this conversation to really bring about the cultural change that we need to see go alongside the systems change that we promote and connect. The other area that we're really focused on is mental health. Um, this is such a critical challenge. Um, there's uh, new laws that were created that created what's called the Interagency Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee, or ISMIC. Um, I, I joke with people, one way you can know that federal systems stick around is if the people give it an acronym. It's kind of scary, but it's kind of true. Um, so the ISMIC was something that was created. Um, and so with ISMIC, what we're doing is really bringing national leaders together and thinking about how we create a comprehensive system of care for individuals struggling with serious mental illness. As a part of that uh, work and body of exercise, we really had an opportunity to celebrate the role that faith leaders and community leaders play in addressing systems of need for individuals struggling with mental illness. Um, some people here today were able to participate in that conversation and help us think through some of those considerations. And we're building on that with next steps. We're gonna do 
um, webinars introducing people to mental illness and helping people know signs and symptoms. And I already mentioned, one in four I think it's one in four individuals who struggle with mental illness go to their faith leader before they go to a mental health professional. So 25% of individuals who struggle with mental illness go to the faith leader. If a faith leader doesn't know the difference between just being down and depression, it can mean the difference between suicide and life. It's that clear cut. If we don't recognize some of those signs and symptoms, if it's not just a matter of saying, oh, you need some spiritual support and encouragement, but no, you actually are experiencing a medical condition that is beyond the ability of my spirituality or my spiritual advice to address. And while I want to be there supporting you and encourage you spiritually, there is something here that goes greater than that that needs medical support that I can't provide. I like to joke with faith leaders um, in workshops and discussions that I do that, that, that churches don't have CT scanners in the nursery space. They don't, I don't know about your guys, but my church doesn't. Um, and so in, in essence, they don't have the tools and resources to address some of those mental health conditions that we are faith leaders need to see our expertise outside of their domain. And then we need to think about how, um, just like with someone who, who is um, in our congregation who are in communities or in uh, temple or mosque, they may, um, uh, gurdwaras, they may, um, someone gets uh, cancer. No one expects that pastor to administer chemotherapy. The person who gets cancer doesn't expect that pastor to administer chemotherapy. If your pastor offers to administer chemotherapy, don't do it. <laughs> but what is the expectation? There's an expectation of social support. There's an expectation of casserole. We joke that mental health is the no casserole disease. When was the last time you took casserole to someone who, who experienced a mental health condition? When was the last time you heard of someone taking casserole to someone who experienced a mental health condition? It's a medical condition just like cancer. And it should be treated with a casserole just like cancer. And it's the opportunity we have as faith leaders to come along and provide that social support that meaningful connection to individuals struggling so that they can participate in recovery down the road, that they can get better and find the ways that they can be healthy again. So it's really emphasizing that there are roles and responsibilities, there are opportunities for faith leaders to get involved in this space. Um, we're gonna be doing also in the same time, another critical component of this is that mental health professionals need to honor and respect people of faith as well community-based institutions, saying that community-based institutions and faith-based institutions and other agencies have a role in supporting, that it's not just a symptom that we need to abate, but a person we need to treat. I like that. I haven't said that before. Thanks for giving that to me. I appreciate you, San Antonio. That we don't just have a symptom we need to treat, but a person we need to serve. That's the opportunity that we have in mental health. So we're celebrating and thinking through ways. Um, the American Psychological Association actually already has levels of competency that they proposed and encouraged. And so we just wanna make sure mental health professionals know about some of those things and can think about the role that faith can have um, in supporting and addressing and increasing services for those experiencing mental illness. Um, let me just touch on a, quick, a couple of areas of key concern. We've already talked a little bit in what, you're, what you guys have as community concerns of addressing vulnerability. Um, whether or not someone is experiencing generational poverty um, or mental health challenges, um, individuals and children who are in foster care at risk of their families going into foster care, we're talking about levels of vulnerability. We're talking, we talked about veterans. Veterans who are experienced, they had, they returning from service, they may have experiences that have led them to experience levels of vulnerability. We need to think about those populations as well and their families. Um, all of these systems, we can think about building systems of care, systems of support that address those levels of vulnerability, um, and think about how we can connect systems and care. We can think about trauma as we think about those things. We can think about prevention when we think about those things. Another thing that we're seeing in generational poverty is interesting. It's the, we take the generational poverty and we say generational solution. They're calling them two-gen solution, two-generation solutions. Anytime you're working with a child, work with a parent. Anytime you're working with a parent, work with a child. Anytime, some, some, some states are working on multi-generation strategies because they're recognizing, and I jump back to opioids, we're seeing an increasing number of grandparents becoming parents because both parents die of overdose deaths and they then get placed with grandparents or next of kin. 
Um, actually, and so we're seeing increasing number of grandparents parenting. We're seeing increasing number of um, multi-generational challenges. And so where possible and where opportunities present themselves, we should not just be working with the parent and the child. Maybe we can also be working with the grandparent. Um, maybe we can also be working with all levels of the of the individual who's ser service to, receiving services. We're seeing those programs have significant outcomes, um, meaningful change that's happening in some of those places, and it's exciting to see that. Um, in um, certainly in children in foster care, um, we are seeing huge numbers of faith communities step into this space and really say we want to be available and support families. Um, projects where. Um, you can go into and um, mentor a family that's struggling. So not just actually take the child into the foster care, you take the mom and the child who are at risk of separation and you mentor both the mom and the child. A program called Safe Families, which is having some significant impacts um, and showing sometimes cost savings in some places where they're implementing that program. Um, in public health, um, I would say, too, just increasing awareness and education is such a critical component of this space, just knowing. We talked about social determinants of health, where hospital health systems are actually prescribing connections to community-based institutions as a way to address your health concerns. And so that's another strategy that might be something to consider as a partnership with the hospital health system. Um, and then just strategies for bringing people together, creating partnerships and relationships. We want to make sure that all organizations um, feel like they can participate in these systems, no matter what their belief or lack thereof is. And so thinking about how all these organizations can participate is something that we're really celebrating and, and strengthening at the national level. Um, so I think I got all of them, but there are things that you may be seeing. There are challenges that you may be thinking about how to address. And if you um, want to know at the national level solutions that we're seeing, I'm glad to try and think of them. Yeah, right here, Amy. Yeah, I'm just wondering, at the national level, if you're talking about elder care and some of the probably growing crises as we have older populations, growing Alzheimer's communities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The Joint Education Committee, the JEC, as a part of Senate. Oh, yeah. That was like double miking. That was, that was horrible. Sorry. Um, just released a study that talked about how increasingly our... Um, senior populations are experiencing uh, levels of loneliness. Um, and, and again, now we're back, small solution. We don't need a national program on loneliness. What we need is people to talk to each other. Go, go forth and prosper, I'm done. Um, you know, we need to create these connections and relationships. Now, uh, interestingly, the UK has actually a, a minister on loneliness. The United Kingdom has actually created a position where there's someone who's in charge of just helping people think about how to connect with each other. <laughs> um, we haven't got there nationally, but we are having some significant conversations, especially in elder care, about how we address uh, loneliness among our seniors, building up connections and relationships uh, to address some of those populations, creating spaces where they can come together and connect, um, separate from institutionalization. Um, this is the whole push. There used to be that the off, there was just the Office of uh, Air Administration on Aging. Now it's called the Administration on Community Living. It reflects this shift away from just saying it's about elderly populations to about actually participating in community and settings and living as a part of that community to bring strength and opportunity. Um, there's great leadership over there in the Administration for Community Living and, and a lot of thought and process about how we uh, strength and partnerships. One of the things I'm excited about too, they're actually implementing some, some concepts related or similar to asset-based community development, where instead of saying um, our seniors are lonely, what are we gonna do about it? They're saying our seniors are lonely, what existing places can we help them connect to? What are the existing opportunities that are places where we can build relationships and connections? Instead of kind of building the wheel, how do we connect them to the existing wheels? that are already in our community if we just think about ways to partner and connect. And I, I'm excited about that initiative because I think it's a strength-based approach. I think it says that there are places where our seniors can participate if we just, in, again, invite them to be involved. So. I wanna piggyback on that. Yeah. So, and I'm moving because I'm gonna, I wanna make sure this person over here talks. But um, there is a summit being planned 
And Sister Jane Ann is going to raise her hand if you want to hear more about the Senior Sabbath Summit that's coming in May for the whole city and all this conversation, um, part of the Department of Human Services, and that, that's happening. But I'm hoping that uh, Deanne would talk a little bit about Senior Planet. Thank you, Anne. Um, my name is Deanne Cuellar, and I'm with Older Adult Technology Services and Director of Senior Planet. And we are working on connecting uh, San Antonians 60 years or older to uh, digital literacy training and classes to build a base of people 60 years or older who are social change advocates here in San Antonio. And um, long story short, we raise money and we provide free classes uh, to people who are six years or older um, in the hope of just um, increasing socialization, decreasing mm -hmm. isolation, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, trying to you know, uh, uh, confront all of those social determinants, the long list that um, you mentioned. And one thing I like hearing about everybody in the audience and I love about today is I love how you all are talking about the core morbidity, if that's the right mm -hmm. term, mm -hmm. of how all of these um, things are connected and, and impact each other. So thank you very much. Thank you. Comorbidity is a good word. Um, so many of these challenges, people don't just have one thing, they have many things. Again, aha moments, dumb moment, people are people. They're not their problems and they're not their conditions and they're not the reasons that they come to our nonprofits. They're just people who have challenges. And if we honor and respect them as people, we need to see that they have many different needs and many different ways in which organizations in our community can connect and contribute, or can connect and contribute, address, support those needs. But we have, if we as an organization just think we have our one thing and that's gonna be the one solution that they need, we don't honor and respect the, the complexity of who they are. And so we need to think about how all these pieces come together to address those challenges um, so that we can think about this per people as people, not just as problems. Bill's coming thing. up behind you. I hope that we have several action teams from the initiative in this room. I hope they're thinking about what they're going to say at the <laughs> microphone under mine, 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 right? Mine. Yeah. Right. So Bill handed the mic over. Hi, my name's Nina. I am a family support worker for the city of San Antonio, and I work with the Head Start program. But I kind of just wanted to mention about kind of marketing your programs and your initiatives, your faith-based initiatives, and what your program does. Because for my program specifically, sometimes parents come in and they believe it's just free daycare. Mm -hmm. They believe it's a pre-K for SA type program where they're just going to get free education for their three and four year olds, and that's not the case. Our program does a comprehensive service. It's a multi-generational approach, as you were saying earlier, and we help them with food services, housing, stability, self-sustainability. -sustain and I think that in doing that, it helps them our goal and our mission is school readiness and lifelong success. So that way they don't get to the point where they have a mental health condition or they're dealing with trauma. So we're trying to do preventative care. So a lot of the, the topics that you've touched today are a lot of the things that I've seen our program do. I'm only in my going into my second year, but I've kind of seen a lot or heard a lot of the topics that you've kind of touched on. I've now realize that our program does a lot of that. And not very many people know when they come to apply for our program that that's what we're intending to do is to try to break that cycle of generational poverty and to try to get them to self-sustain, to maybe get off of you know food stamps, to maybe get off of housing, to go into training for job success, to go into you know really becoming an example for their next generation. So I kind of just wanted to, one, thank you for saying all those topics because it's really touched home for me because it, it, it makes me really truly understand that the purpose that I'm serving is actually going to hopefully really help these families that I'm, that I'm taking care of. So thank you. Thank you. Head Start and our child care centers can be a great place for connecting and coordinating with populations in need. Um, I might say too, uh, one of my pro the projects that I was really excited to find out about was a project that uh, was reworking a, a Head Start center so that the parents would connect with each other better. And once parents connect with each other, one of the things they found was that um, 
at the end of the program where they were really focusing on parents connecting with each other, um, individuals reported that they had three times as many people they could go to in a crisis. So again, we're back at social capital, we're back at these measures of just thinking through how relationships make a difference. If there are three times as many people as you can have in a crisis to go to for support, that means you keep your job when you're late at work and you can't pick up your child from Head Start. That means that when your um, power goes out or your you know, AC or your water heater floods, then you have one more person who can take your child or program to another place. And that is that support that makes such a huge difference in the outcomes that are being achieved. Yanidi, you have something else? Oh. In that, I had a recent experience with one of my families who was experiencing domestic abuse, and she did not have any support. She does not have her own family. All she had was her husband's family. And they were not on her side. They were on, her, on their son's side. So luckily, I was able to gain enough rapport with this mother who came to me and asked for help. And in that, now she's thriving. Now she has, you know, a, she's in career training. She's looking to be a medical assistant. She's back in school. Her kids are happy. It's just, it's amazing because support in itself does so much. When you don't have it, you don't have anyone to turn to. You don't know what resources to look for. And one thing I'm kind of really looking forward to is we have this new initiative that's about to start called Youth Reengagement. And it's for the 16 to 24 year olds who are no longer engaged in the community. And so they're trying to find ways to get them back into the community, get them back into going to, into school. But the thing with, about it is, is that they're so disengaged that we need to re reach out to them. We need to be that support. We need to tell them, hey, I'm here and I can get you to a place where you will feel good about yourself and maybe hopefully help someone else along the way. So yeah, sorry, thank you. Yeah. Disconnected youth. Is it's all about pleasure. relationship. Again, there you go. Yes, <laughs> so good afternoon, and again, uh, thank you for being here. My Dr. Pleasure. Ricardo Gonzalez with the University of the Incarnate Word. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here, but I, and if there's a way we can get a listing of everybody that's here so that we can connect and network, because if we're talking about resources, I've been in higher ed for over 25 years, and we may not even know who's in this room and how to make those resources and make those connections as the complexity is getting so very complex. Um, I say that because you're mentoring culture, you're mentoring gender, you're mentoring gender issues, um, race, discrimination, socioeconomics. There's so, our, our population is so complex in so many different ways. Um, I've worked with so many districts, with so many nonprofits, and everybody has a different issue, and sometimes we get siloed in our issue, and that's okay because uh, if there's a way that we can focus on that, because we at the University of the Incarnate Word, we cannot uh, do mental health all the time. We cannot do pre-K-4. We cannot be doing senior services. But everybody in the community is doing that, right? Um, so focus on that and do that well. And then let us connect those connections, like you're saying, working together, collaborate together, um, finding our weaknesses and latching on together. But, and if we can, again, put those connections, and this is a great way to do that. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, and I know... Uh, I have a colleague here for the Give Pulse, but if there's a way that we can also be on the same platform, right? So if, uh, for example, I don't know. You're if talking know, technology. Technology, Just so everybody right? knows. But if um, I don't know if many people in this room know, but all of our undergraduate students, you know, IEW are required to do community service. Mm -hmm. They have to do 45 hours before they graduate. I know everybody in this room is like going to contact UIW in my <laughs> office. We need volunteers, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is we need to get the word out and help each other, right? I live in the northwest side in Helotus, uh, driving all the way in town, but there's so much need between Helotus and W.W. White. There's so much need from Southwest ISD to, um, wow, we can go all the way to shirts. There's need everywhere, but we just need to work together and really see what we can do. So I just say thank you. I know there's so much going on. The last thing I want to say is um, I think in San Antonio, but across the country, when it comes to faith-based, we get stuck sometimes with only seeing our faith-based community come together when it's racism or religious issue. And they don't see our faith-based community like I'm seeing right now is with all issues that impact our community. And if we were to do monthly celebrations, like you were saying, on poverty and showing all the faith-based community coming out saying, we're gonna tackle poverty together. 
we're going to tackle hunger. And I know they will start saying, well, they're there all the time. Well, yes, we're here all the time, 24-7, 365. It's not just when there's a racism or anti-Semitic thing. This is all the time we're here together because, you know, God love the government. But if the government shuts down, we're still going to be here, mm -hmm. no matter mm -hmm. what. You still were here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Uh, we'll get the list out of everyone here. If you don't want your name on that list, you'll need to tell us that. And it also depends on how clear your printing is, just to say, right? So if you've given us your email, you make sure we really have your email. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, one of the things um, that we're just this coming month, starting next Tuesday, we have a, a weekly newsletter that goes out, News We Can Use if you're not on that, but this next month in particular, we're gonna be sending out those resourcing list of connectivity, all right? So each week you're gonna just get another layer of that, of, of other places and other ways, and we're trying to pull many of those together, but you know, we, one step at a time. So we'll be watching for those. Every week you're gonna be getting another whole set that's out there, okay? But you'll also get this list along with all the other things now in your ginormous email. Yeah. Can I Was there say, somebody over there? Oh, let me just say real quick. Complexity is complex. <laughs> and how we think about addressing these challenges is something that everybody is wrestling with. Because everybody sees that, every, that people have many different problems, but how do we have our own expertise, but also leverage other expertise how do we not just be one huge nonprofit that takes care of everyone and everything because we put it all under this hat and just say it's all here, just meet all these needs right away. It's not gonna happen. We each mm -hmm. have our own systems. I mean, I'll go back. This is what's really interesting. We, we have a system by which the social sector contributes from us going to 22, 22nd in the world to two. All those organizations, all those different activities, both local government, state government, federal government, um, um, just individual contributions and services, we're all wrestling with how we address that complexity. I think what, what Anne and you're doing is it, by focusing on some areas of concern that are some things that connect to people, that's great because I think it actually gives you some organizational strategy and some opportunities to or orchestrate Rather and, and organize around some key issues that a lot of people care about. Um, I think increasingly you'll see that there are intersections and relationships between those different issues and, and opportunities, but how we work through that is both the answer and the question. I believe part of it has to do with relationship. I believe part of it has to do with increased communication because that's how it happens all the rest of the time. But how we do it and how we leverage technology effectively and again, I'll go back. Communication, speech is a technology, just like uh, our phones are. How we leverage that is one of the many things we're all wrestling with right now. And so uh, know you're in good company, I think is what I'm trying to say, San Antonio. Know that others are wrestling and trying to figure out these pieces too. Um, and I think what's exciting is, is where we do see it happening. There's a lot of pieces coming together and a lot more conversation and dialogue that's really critical for seeing some of these changes occur. So, yes. Ed Sackett, and as we're talking about mental health and trauma, one of the things that, that uh, we're discovering and uh, you're actually teaching at uh, Austin Seminary hmm. is geneograms. Hmm. Uh, because we treat things at the present, but we don't think about the systemic issues that could go back generations. Mm -hmm. And if, as faith leaders, if we will start using gene geneograms whenever we're talking with parishioners and those who seek help from us and have them start doing geneograms, they can discover where the trauma has started, often mm -hmm. generations back. Mm -hmm. They can also discover where the mental health problems have started generations back so that they realize that it's just not them, it's just not the now. Mm -hmm. This actually connects further back and you, you can help them understand many of the issues they face, uh, you know, abuse, hmm. and, and all of these cycles that we're trying to break, if people can see them in their past and see where they've come from and, and where they stem from, a lot of times it gives them a greater uh, ability to grasp that and realize that it's not their fault and gives them the ideas that, okay, here's where it started, 
let me break this cycle by not allowing it to go past my generation. Mm -hmm. The geneogram and kind of mapping made me think of two other strategies that I think are really important. One is, is um, which, what a graduate student can help you with uh, is social network analysis, where you can go into your community and actually see where the people are and who they connect with and talk to, and then know that, um, I mean, my favorite example of this is Aunt Sally. Aunt, you know, if you don't talk to Aunt Sally, then you haven't talked to anybody in the community. If an Aunt Sally doesn't approve of you, then no one approves of you. And so if you're, as your organization or your service minute organization is not talking to Aunt Sally, then you're missing a huge part of your population. You can find Aunt Sally's through social network analysis to help you know where those people are. Sometimes they're people, sometimes they're institutions, sometimes they're a community center like this one that can help you identify. Um, but let me say this too, and I, we mentioned it, graduate students can be a great resource. PhD candidates can be an asset for you and your community to come in and do some of that data collection that they need for their research paper to, to help showcase some of those opportunities. So leverage graduate students, leverage uh, other individuals who can help support some of these outcomes. Hi, I'm George. I'm the pastor of Baptist Temple in Southeast San Antonio. We were one of the largest churches, very rich back in the 1950s. And now we're a congregation of 100 with 80,000 square foot facility on, uh, on three acres. So we could either let it deteriorate and shut down like so often happens. We decided instead that we we're gonna open it up to the community to become a hub of services. So we have seven, uh, six other churches meeting with us on Sundays. We have two schools, an early learning center and a charter school. And we have a variety of uh, non-for-profits that, that work out of our building. We have no money, but we have lots of building. We don't have a lot of social capital, but we attract it. So the, the secret to our success has been partnering with outside organizations. We have the facilities and we have a network. We have access to one of the most uh, underprivileged areas in San Antonio, on the, the south side. And uh, so uh, it can be done. Even, you, even if you have a smaller facility, you can always have one or two other people meeting there. But it's, uh, and we're still looking for people. Recently, we were able to purchase a house next door. We had a very generous donation, and a lot of volunteers came in and, and got it up to speed. And our goal was to have uh, uh, students, uh, resident interns, either social work students or ministry students that'll live in there for a semester and work with the children of our community. We ha our, our goal is to work with not children nine to 14 in order to get them to the point where they will graduate from high school. You know, we, we have some, uh, what people think are bad high schools uh, in the South Side. You know what, they're not. They have great teachers, they have great programs. Two of our kids, two kids from our school, one graduated from Highlands, and one from McCullough, they both have full ride uh, scholarships to Incarnate Word. And uh, in fact, the drum major for Incarnate Word came from Baptist Temple. Uh, I can't say that often enough. I, I'm more more proud than, than you can imagine. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and we still need more. Right now, we don't have uh, any students living in the house. It's, it's still, uh, we're, we're recruiting. Well, we just did it. This is our first year doing the house, so we don't know what we're doing. We just know, <laughs> we knew how to build a house. Mm -hmm. And we thought if we built it, they would come. So I'm making an appeal right now. Help me get some people <laughs> in that house because we want to work with these children. Uh, we've, that's the only way to, that we know of to break the cycle of poverty mm -hmm. is to get these children graduating from high school, get them into Incarnate Word, get them into the military, get them jobs, get them something. Thanks for that. Um, they, it makes you think of a couple different points. We're going to come to Doug next. Um, many times we wrestle with resource in our community. We wrestle with not having enough resources, and many times that's funding. But we often neglect other forms of capital that we may be rich in uh, because we are thinking in terms of scarcity rather than abundance. When we think about an abundance methodology, we say, I have all this space that no one's using. How can it be leveraged? What could it be used for? Some great examples of faith communities and community-based institutions hosting nonprofit incubators or business incubators. Um, some churches who are leveraging their um, kitchen that may not be, be using as much on Wednesday night anymore, convert, bringing it up to code so it's commercially available, and then renting it out one day a week to use for um, small business cooking incubators. 
to create jobs in the community, create a business in the community for individuals who are struggling, leveraging some amazing cooking, um, which can be such a great resource. And again, thinking about how cooks in our community are capital rather than resources being something we struggle with. Um, so thinking through our different levels of capital, and then let me share this one story because I, I love sharing this story. Um, <clears throat> There was a domestic violence program, a uh, partner violence program that was working in the community who's, uh, where they usually met um, was being renovated. So they went to a church down the street and uh, they asked if they could meet there. And when they uh, asked, the, the faith leader said, yes, it'd be wonderful, go ahead, we'll use this space, it's not being used on this night. So they used it and the pastor just happened to walk by and visit the, the session and was just really personally moved by the discussion that was happening and how these women were being served. So he approached the director of the program afterwards and said, okay, I'm on board. Tell me how I can help. What am I gonna do? And so um, the director said, well, you know, it's been great using your space. It's been great hosting the class here. Um, we have to pay to use our other space. Could we use this space for free? No one else is using it. The pastor said, great, that's good. Not enough, tell me more. What else can I do to help? Well, many times the women who come to this class um, don't ha have childcare. And so the kids are running around the class when they can't get to childcare. Um, so I don't know what we can do about that. He says, well, I have, I'm a church. I have a nursery. I have nursery workers who can come by the congregation, watch the kids in the, in the nursery while the women go through the domestic violence training course conversation that you want to facilitate. Um, the person says, great. He says, what else can I do? He says, well, the, the women many times are using public transportation and they'll have a hard time getting dinner as a part of coming to the meeting. And he says, well, if you come on Wednesday night, we have Wednesday night dinner, they'll get dinner for free and then they can go to the class. And we'll have the Sunday school workers who are, or the, the nursery workers who are already here to watch the kids anyway, so it'll be great, we'll do that. Okay, great, what else can I do to help? He was, he was really moved, it was a really good session. Um, and so the woman says, well, they have to use public transportation, they have to use, ride the bus, and sometimes they're not on the bus route, and so it's hard for them to get here. It says, great, I have a van. I'm gonna drive and pick up as many as I can to bring them here to the church to eat the food where we can take care of their kids, where you can then provide the class. Nursery, bus, space, and people who care. Not money, not a grant, just existing assets in the community that could be leveraged to strengthen. The program tells the pastor, you've just addressed the three top reasons why women drop out of our program. With existing resources that that faith leader had, and it all happened because someone was renovating space. Um, these are ways that we can leverage resources in our community that are already there, assets that are available in our, uniquely in our faith communities. Sometimes buses that aren't being used anymore because we don't have as many people to pick up or connect with, but we can still connect and leverage to serve our community. So just think about all the different assets that are available to you in different spaces and places to address need. Yeah, Doug. Uh, ben, Doug Beach. Um, thank you for making my point that I was just gonna make. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to. No, because earlier you said something about how can we reduce complexity to make answers and solutions more attainable. And uh, part of that was, you know, uh, the next part of that conversation was relationships and trust. So what happened in that example you just gave was people got into conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, and I've worked a lot in the mental health area, and I can assure you that when you're working with people with significant mental health issues, the complexity sometimes becomes, and, and being a parent of a person with a mental illness, it's, it's overwhelming. You know, you just sort of, at some point, you just want to give up. And uh, I think that, uh, so a lot of people that work in the area of mental health, it's easy to get overwhelmed, but I think that what uh, saves us a lot of times is you focus on one person. Mm -hmm. And that's where the relationship and the trust come in. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to work with anybody where there's not a relationship and there's no trust. So one of the things we work on in NAMI is helping build relationships and helping people understand that it's not always the solution you come up with, it's the trust mm -hmm. that person has. Mm -hmm. So in, in working with people in faith communities, what, what's, our, what's the coin of the realm? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of it is relationship and trust 
and faith. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we should not cut ourselves short in terms of, the, you know, one of the best tools we have to work with, which is reaching out. Which brings me to the, uh, the other part. Uh, three years ago when Kay Warren was here from California, and she talked about crawl, walk, run in your congregations as far as how to move along this uh, path of doing more and more for people with mental illness. She said, too often times we're sitting on a pew with somebody and they mentioned that they had depression. and They had a hard time getting to church today. And she says, oftentimes the impulse is for people to move further away. She said, move closer. Mm -hmm. Lean in. So, you know, it's, uh, these are complex problems, but they have to begin in solving some of these with caring mm -hmm. for other people. And then I think if we can share information, if we can share resources, just like you've illustrated, mm -hmm. we can solve a lot of these problems, or at least we can, uh, things get better yeah. that way. Yeah. Thanks, Doug. And I want to honor Doug and, and thank him for the contributions he's made for me and my learning in this space and the mental health work and, and so many different ways. I appreciate that. And the Pathways of Hope Conference was such a meaningful conference for me to, to really see some of the great work going on in this space. So I want to thank Doug for that conference and the work that they're doing there too. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> but I think that maybe I'm going to emphasize the one point, which is that we have to lean into challenges rather than backing away from them. We have to step toward concerns and challenges rather than being afraid of them. Um, fear can be something that keeps us from connecting and relating. Um, and actually, um, I would say to not seeking understanding, not just seeking, and here we're back at compassion and empathy, and we're back at relationships. Um, those people we care about, we listen to, we spend time with, we connect with. Um, I'll say this one, uh, I always think about this. We, we're talking about human services today. Humans connect. <laughs> and the fact that we're going back to this idea that, that relationships matter and that we listen to people that we work with, it's just such a novel concept, but it's really not. It goes all the way back. It's that ancient technology of communication that's so critical and listening. Maybe that's the other technology we need to leverage a little bit more is being able to listen as much as we communicate to be a participant in those relationships and really seek out the change that we're looking for, so. Ben, would you say that the Pathways to Hope Mental Health Conference in San Antonio, Texas is like leading that effort by having that conference Very across the so. country? Very much so, and that's something we- He said that, I'm about. quoting him. <laughs> I mean, we would love, and, and, and I came to the Mental Health, or the Pathways to Hope Conference because I have heard such great things from other people around the country about what that conference is doing helping people lean into mental health, better understand mental health, hear from individuals who struggle with mental health issues so that they can understand and then relate better and serve better in the community. So yeah, it's a great example. Intentional so. connection. I got a person here. Uh, I'm just interjecting. Doug, <laughs> what are the dates on Pathways this year, August? 23rd and 24th, the best conference in the city and it's free. <laughs> Good to know, thank you, Ann. <laughs> I'm Wendy Holbrook with Interfaith San Antonio Alliance, and we're a new organization, but our point is bringing together congregational leaders for civic engagement, and our current project is affordable housing. Hmm. So this is an area where the resources in congregations are just really coming to the fore mm -hmm. because this is happening around the country. But I'm going to call out my friend Eric back here because <laughs> Travis Park United Methodist is well engaged in the process of repurposing property on that they own, their space, mm -hmm. to create affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Mission Concepcion is spearheading the work of the Archdiocese as they repurpose the St. John Seminary for multi-income housing, mm -hmm. but making sure that affordable housing is provided mm -hmm. for the people who are already there and have lived in that community for generations. So think about your resources. Mm -hmm. You have amazing assets. I was at an event a week or so ago, and an architect says to me, well, it's all about money. You gotta have money. Money's the answer to all this. And I said, well, okay, yeah. I mean, you know, it's going to take a lot of money. I don't question that. But then I said, are you aware of what congregations are doing 
in utilizing their assets? And he's like, oh, no, I don't. wow, that's, that's great. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So we have incredible assets on all kinds of levels. We just have to start thinking creatively mm -hmm. how to utilize those. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah, I think being, being creative, think outside the box, I think. And um, can I say this too? I think we have an opportunity to educate systems on those opportunities and connections and going and, and tr encouraging openness with those nonprofit systems. Encouraging, saying, I have a strength and I want to develop and create, support that strength within your organization by sharing what I know in this space and what I'm able to think about. So I think we have to build capacity in the whole by bringing our strength into other people's space. Um, and then sharing, honoring that um, as a part of that complementing structure we talked about earlier. So, yes, excellent. Yeah, yeah uh, my name is Fatma. I'm co coming from a very small organization. Actually, we only have only one staff and 100 maybe uh, members. Uh, and we mostly do work on interfaith, intercultural, mutual understanding, being bridges between people, you know, connecting, hopefully, people. And the best thing we do as Turkish Americans is to cook, cook different kind of food. Mm. <laughs> and supposedly everybody likes the food. So what we do <laughs> is we share our food and then we collaborated with the food bank mm -hmm. last uh, Ramadan for 28 nights and invited mm. uh, everybody else, not only the Muslims, but everybody who wants to come to our organization. We collaborated with other churches, but every night a uh, community was our guest for they, they just, uh, you know, we ate together, we break our fast together, but then we collected uh, lots of beans for the food bank. Mm. And then other thing we do is on Sundays, I don't know if you know about this, but Turkish breakfast is very huge on Sundays, <laughs> large breakfast. So uh, we do once in a month a breakfast and then we invite everybody else and we always share the benefits with a local like Habitat for Humanity Food Bank, mm -hmm. or you know anybody who wants to share it. That's wonderful. So it's something small, but something you can do. But it's an example. We we you know as a community we honor food. We love food. We're going to share that strength with others in our community and honor and and bring that resource into the space. Um, I, I love that. I think it's amazing. I think um, we often don't think about how we can leverage the table. Again. <laughs> We're talking ancient technology. Have you heard of this thing they called a table? It's amazing. We get around it and we talk. And then we put food on top and we eat it too. It's amazing. And um, we, we have better conversation when we have food around the table. And we enjoy each other. We spend time together. As a part of celebrating success, how are you just spending time together? Not just to say our success and not just to do our newsletter, just to enjoy each other's company. It's a part of relationships that we neglect because we think we have to be so service oriented. You gotta get the job done. No, sometimes we just need to enjoy each other's company and just to celebrate. Um, I always love to tell and share um, um, the, in the, the Sikh community have gudwaras and gudwaras are also um, places where if you come, they will serve you food. Um, and I've encouraged various gudwaras that I've talked to in the Sikh community just to make their, their, their eating time, something that they invite nonprofits into the community to participate in, to invite, invite the community and say, hey, we're, we're cooking. We're going to be making enough food. You should be here to eat some too because um, you need to eat. Again, an ancient technology called eating. Um, furloughed workers, exactly. Like just, hey, we're going to be cooking. Why don't you come in and, and participate? I think there's so many of these places that we can participate and connect and build relationships around um, and, and food can be an amazing place that does that. So thank you for sharing that story. Fatma didn't tell you, and there's some numbers here, it's like a community of 100. And during Ramadan last year, they fed 30,000 people beyond the 100. So if you've never been to Raindrop Turkish House, you could see Fatma, it's great food. <laughs> and uh, nonprofits, congregations, and go during Ramadan to learn about Ramadan and just enjoy fabulous food. How do 100 people serve 30,000 <laughs> every night? That's awesome. And they're not a restaurant. Yeah. Anyone else? Or mine, mine, mine time. <laughs> it's, it's been amazing this last week. Today, I got 
two friends of mine that surprised me, uh, very positively surprised me. I've been a, I've been in charge of literacy to some extent, and we'll tell you maybe, maybe not. Anyway, there is a literacy problem, a literacy problem in San Antonio. If you don't know it, you're not watching. There's a lot of children, especially uh, those in elementary school. We found out that pre four K four pre K is working, but we've still got a serious problem in San Antonio in literacy. We have so many people here, and seventy five. We're seventy fifth in the number of large cities in the United States in literacy. Mm. On another note, last week I visited with an apartment manager uh, about two blocks from the church where I attend, and also a uh, somebody from the school where all my kids went to school. You may not realize it, and I may want to talk to the young lady who just spoke, but there are a significant number of Muslims moving to San Antonio. A significant number. I worked for one about all summer long this summer and got to know and love her as much as I could. It was a great experience. And I think that we all, but we all need to realize, I mean, we've got, I think one lady here today representing her faith, where we've got all these other people here who represent their own particular faith, but we are going to be having a growing number of Muslims. And when we approached the school about what we can do for that school, they said, we, we need for those parents to learn English. The last thing I thought we'd be asking to be done, I thought we were going to talk about coats and yeah. pants <laughs> and uniforms and things like that, but the families want to learn how to speak English. Mm -hmm. The apartment house that I talked to, they have 500 apartments and 80% of them are rented by Muslims. And I'm not, this, uh, that's not bad, it's just change. And that's yeah. what we have to be thinking about. Yeah. Thanks for that. And honoring the diversity that's in our community is such a critical challenge. Let me share one other thing that I like to describe and, and put in people's minds. Um, sometimes it may be exciting to switch from having ESL classes to SSL classes, Spanish language classes. How can your community be someplace where the Spanish people come to teach other people Spanish rather than them coming to you to speak English? Um, one community I shared this idea with, they were really wanting to hear from the Hispanic community about the challenges they were experiencing, but the Hispanic community wouldn't come to them because they wouldn't bring their challenges and their frustrations and the things that were hard to the community. And when I said, what would it look like if you, um, encourage them to teach Spanish to you, which helped them see their own authority so that they could see they have the expertise and knowledge to come to you when they have a problem and a challenge that you could be helpful with. Um, so that you can create this sense of authority for them, that they have something that's worth us listening to and educating on that can then lead to change. The other part of that conversation was that one of the um, faith leaders in that community led a congregation, a Spanish-speaking congregation and he worked in a lot of construction. So he said, why don't you have that faith leader who works in construction teach construction workers Spanish so that it's not just Spanish like ESL or just Spanish for the sake of Spanish. It's actually what terms do I need to know on the construction site so that I can speak well to other people who are doing construction? And how can that pastor be empowered to speak to other communities with some of this knowledge? They were ex so excited about what possibilities were possible by empowering um, local leadership and minority leadership to have authority and to treat, uh, teach others in the community what might be possible. And then to think about what change might be possible on some of the job sites where these uh, job foremans would have a better understanding of the, the Spanish language that can lead to better work because they know, you know, for lack of a better word, construction Spanish. Um, and so there may be opportunities where we can kind of flip the script and create opportunities where we can learn from communities being served rather than necessarily serving the community. So, or, or creating, promoting agency is what that really is about. So, two more and then the exercise before we get to go. Hi, I'll be quick. I'm Dawn and I work with a nonprofit and interfaith nonprofit here. And I'm relatively newish, only two years. And one thing 
that I've been inspired by and struck by in building collaborations in San Antonio, and I'd like to hear your experience from a national mm -hmm. standpoint on reflection. Um, and I think it kind of adds complexity to the complementarity that you were talking about is so many agencies, communities, groups, individuals willing to enter into risk and transform risk into possibility. So when we're creating collaborations where maybe it was like, oh, we've never done that, or we cannot collaborate with them, it becomes, can we? <laughs> And so there's been this amazing kind of transformation or shift that I've experienced being involved where you have, yes, you have risk assessment, you have risk management, but you also have this kind of foray, this entering into risk mobilization and risk transformation. Mm -hmm. How do we go there and be with one another in ways that we haven't been before? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not territorialness, it's not complementarity, mm -hmm. it's going in there and saying, well, people don't expect this or they haven't done this before, but how do we inhabit risk in a way that's responsible and responsive to the needs that we see ourselves met with? I love it. Um, well, one, first, one thing I say to some staff in the office sometimes, I say, I say the question is the answer. <laughs> so, so first, the question is the answer, yes. Um, uh, let me frame this a couple different ways. One, um, when we work together and we share success, we also share failure or we should, um, I think what we need are feedback loops constantly where we're asking, are we achieving what we're setting out to achieve so that we minimize risk as much as possible and we're communicating that process in an effective and structured way um, so that all of us are working toward the thing we're actually working toward. Um, uh, but if we don't have an honest and robust appreciation of risk, we're not going to have an honest and robust appreciation of success. And the fear of risk is going to keep us from moving towards good outcomes. Um, I would again go back to relationships and saying that it goes back again to understanding that, that um, partnerships and collaborations are just big networks of relationships. And if, so we're not, if we're not treating collaborations, <laughs> let's say, uh, when I talk about and do a workshop on collaboration, I say, I don't know about you, but, but marriage is not the easiest thing in my life. What are you guys laughing about? What are you talking about? It's hard being in relationship. Um, the best things are the hardest things. My marriage and my kids are my best things and my hardest things. I don't know about you. <laughs> and they're good kids and have an amazing life, but they're really hard because relationships are hard. They, they, um, include risk and they include success. So as a part of our collaborative structures and the ways we work together, we have to treat them similarly with that both honor and a sense of realization that they're a relationship, they're a challenge. A, a, a well-structured collaboration is very similar to a marriage um, with the understanding and considerations of challenges they're in. And so, um, when we are asking those questions, we're asking the right questions and we're wrestling with the right things so that we can be about the right ends, um, ultimately. But um, it, it, is a, it is a, I think we're increasingly understanding that, but, but um, I say too in the social capital space, it's still an understanding that the soft things lead, understanding and working on the soft things lead to hard outcomes. And if we don't appreciate those relationship challenges, then we're not actually getting to the hard outcomes that we're looking to achieve. So it's an increasing realization, but not something that has been realized yet. So, yeah. Okay, um, thinking of lots of different things, com connections with all the things people have been saying, but starting with this gentleman here about education, because um, uh, I'm, I'm a presentation sister, and our charism has always been education to justice. Mm. So I just think of it, this whole sense of, when we're talking about compassion at San Antonio, we're talking about social justice. Mm -hmm. And what I see lacking in much of the faith community is the challenge to our people to, to do something, change the system. Mm. Uh, I belong to the Interfaith Welcome Coalition, and we work with immigrants, welcoming them all the time. We have um, a presentation ministry place where we teach English as a second language, citizenship, community building, mm. okay? We believe in the two feet. 
One is the direct action, but the other is the justice piece that I feel is missing. I, my heart was flip-flopping this morning and reading the article in the paper about the poverty here in San Antonio. And the, the base poverty has decreased, but what is increasing is the working families' mm -hmm. lack of possibilities. They called it ALICE, an acronym. I'm concerned about the angry people in our society that are not wanting the poor to receive help because they're not getting help. What is our response to the working poor in our midst? Answer question. <laughs> question answer. I'm just calling you, man. You know, oh, that's what you've been sorry. saying all day. Uh, answer, <laughs> the question is the answer. Yeah, that works so well. It gets me out of so many <laughs> challenges. No. Um, um, we need to think through and wrestle with the challenges that anyone in our community is facing. But I think here's here what I would say too. We not just need to think about the need, but we need to think the system that's creating the need. When we think about people who are frustrated in the community about what we need to think about is the system that's creating that frustration. And we need to honor and respect that anger just as much as we honor and respect the need to serve the population because we're not going to see solutions that are systemic until we think about both because they're all part of the system. Um, I think um, we have opportunities to listen. We have opportunities to speak uh, into these spaces and to seek out change. And then we have the challenge. I'm reminded um, that mercy happens quickly, but justice takes time. It is a super long road. Um, and so while we can be merciful and mercy comes quickly, um, justice takes time. Um, and so our participation in the conversations and the dialogues that we have lead to changes that are about bringing about change. And I think the way that San Antonio is approaching these things with compassion in mind that and then thinking through how we have the conversations to think about the changes in the system. Um, those are the conversations we need to be having. Those are the dialogues and the sharing and the um, discussion that needs to happen because I don't think it'll happen without conversation. It won't happen without relationship. It won't happen without listening. Um, and then seeking, bringing about, participating in the change that we want to see happen. And I think you talked about how you are involved in those conversations and dialogues. Um, and I would go back to Doug's comment too, which I thought was so powerful, one person at a time. One person experiencing justice at a time. One person experiencing uh, human flourishing at a time. Because unless we think about that one person, it can get super over, it's even just the question is super overwhelming at the same time. But if we go back and we think about individuals and then we think about how we change it for one individual, then we change it for a family, then we change it for a, a geographic block, then we change it for a neighborhood, then we change it for part of a city. Um, I'll share this as a model, as a quick example. Um, whenever somebody comes to us and asks for a federal grant, I say, do you get local funding? Are you great at getting local donations? First and foremost, if you're not great at receiving local donations, then you're not gonna get a federal grant. Because the next step from getting a local donation is getting city funding or county funding. If you're not going to get getting county funding, then you're not going to get federal funding. And you kind of just go up state funding. And then after you're competitive at the state level, you may consider. The same thing goes for the, the change that we're seeking in our community. It starts with one change in one life. And then it starts with the next step and the next step and the next step. And we see that happen as we participate in those conversations. We'll see changes occur as we advocate. Because I think what you said, two steps, mercy and justice, mercy and justice, mercy. Like serve the need, address the change in the system. Serve the need, address the change in the system so that they go hand in hand and we see the, dif the difference made that we're looking for in our communities. Because we're passionate not just about um, seeing needs uh, abated, but actually problems solved. The system that's not creating cha challenges, but actually changing the system so that problems 
less frequently occur. That's what we want to work towards. As faith leaders, I think it's what many faith traditions call us to. It's what community leaders are looking for. And if we participate in those conversations, we'll see more of that happen. Here's the deal, though, and then we're moving to the exercise. Yeah. So when I hear that conversation, and you use the word passion, it is it comes from that heart set, mm. right? And then if we like push it a little bit, it becomes our mindset. Mm. But the truth of the matter is to add compassion into a system, which is made up of people, is a skill set. Mm. And we haven't yet done all the work about how do you build the skills to actually interject within a whole entire system, compassion. It's not just a nice idea. After skills come habits. And then they become habits. So <laughs> I'm gonna put up here, and then Ben is gonna start the exercise. I'm gonna put up here the link to the compassion integrity training that specifically teaches how the skill set for adding compassion systemically. Okay, it's now yours, do it. It's your, actually, it's yours. You mentioned the card. Here's what I want you to, if, if you have, see if what you wrote on your card meets this requirement or could. Related to areas of concern, both nationally and locally. So all of the different issues we talked about, all the different issues you raised. What big idea would you want to be a part of or invest in? What big idea would you want to be a part of or invest in? What first step could you take to get started? What big idea are you already a part of that you might want to tweak after hearing something today? So this doesn't have to be a new thing. It can be something that you're already doing that can be slightly different. Or it can just be the thing you're already doing, you're excited about. It's a big thing. You're already participating. And then think about it this way. If you were 10 times bolder, if you were, or another way of looking at this, I love this, they call it the 15% solution. If you were 15% bolder, it's so just enough to make you think hard, but not enough to overwhelm you, 15%. What would you propose? Here are some key things to think about. It has to be something that's feasible for you to implement. So we talked about how it's not something that you're gonna say, we're gonna create a grant program. Well, do you have someone to create a grant? If you don't have a person to create a grant, then don't propose a grant program, um, <laughs> unless you're gonna fund the grant. And then please propose it. We're excited to hear about your grant program. Um, it has to originate within your sector. Your idea cannot voluntold another sector the idea to implement. I, I typed in voluntold to my Word, do, Word document and didn't autocorrect. I am so proud that voluntold is officially a word now because um, Word said so. Um, so it, your idea can't say, we want San Antonio Health and Human Services too if you're not Anne from Health and Human Services. You, see, you can't say, I want all nonprofits too if you're not working for all nonprofits. <laughs> you can say if you're from your nonprofit, your nonprofit can do that, but not all nonprofits. You're Temple Baptist. You can't say all the churches are going to do this. You can say Temple Baptist can do this. Um, I want you to remember that big problems often have small solutions. So your big idea doesn't have to be big. It might be small, but it could have a big impact. And remember what, we've, what you've learned from Compassion in Action, that the, we want to seek the greatest change for the least amount of negative impact. So, take your card, write your big idea down. We're going to give you four minutes. And everybody needs a card, right? Everybody needs a card. If you don't have a card, and we're going to do something with these in a second. Yes. Starting out, your four minutes started now. Write down your big idea. What is your big idea for San Antonio? What is your big idea for you? What is the big idea for your sector that you could implement? Don't voluntold someone else. For those of you who are still, who are wrapped up, this is called a crowdsourcing exercise. It's something you can do to gather ideas quickly from a room and identify the best ideas in the room. Um, it comes from a set of strategies called liberating structures, which we've used in various meetings to really capture the wisdom of everybody in the room um, you can go to that website and look for other strategies that can really, um, instead of having experts speak up front, it really helps everyone in the room contribute to the conversation. So uh, it can be a really powerful way to um, draw information out from a meeting.
Uh, we had a meeting at the White House one time where we used this. We had 60 people, and everybody felt like they contributed to the dialogue that we had at that meeting as a result of using the structures that we did. So everybody take their card, wave it around. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to stand. Everybody stand. You're moving around for this. It's going to get fun. Bring your pen. Grab your pen. Keep your pen in your hand. If you didn't have a pen, let me know. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to take someone's card, someone's going to take your card. Then you're going to take that card and hand it to another person's card. When I ring the bell, you're going to stop. You're going to read that card. You're going to flip that card over, and from 1 to 10, you're going to rate that idea. So if you don't think it's a good idea, you're going to give it a 1. If you think it's a great idea, you're going to give it a 5. It's going to be a random card. You don't know who wrote it. You don't know where it came from. You're just going to say what you think about that idea. I want to encourage you to be honest. This doesn't work if you're like, oh, all these ideas are great. Let's do them all. Unless you want to do all the ideas that come up in the room, don't rate them all well. Say, honest, like, again, you don't know where this card's coming from. Could be your best friend who wrote it, but it's okay. <laughs> be honest with your feedback. It's going to help us have ideas that's going to lead to next steps that you can take as compassionate San Antonio. So we're going to do this four times. You're going to take your idea, you're going to read a card four times. No, uh, okay, so everybody ready? Okay. Exchange. Five is best, one is worst. But you're not rating right now, you're just exchanging. Move cards around. Make sure everybody's got your card. Nope, nope, just keep going. We're going to do it four times. You're going to give four ratings. Stop! Okay. Take your card, read it, flip it over, and give it a score of one to five. One being bad, a not good idea, something you don't want to participate in implementing. Five being something you would be excited to implement. One through five. One is not a good idea, five is a great idea. And look up me, give me your eyes, let me make sure you're ready. Everybody's given a score. Remember, you don't want to implement everybody's ideas, you just want to implement the best ideas. Okay, exchange. Yep, go again. <laughs> FYI, if you get your card back, Guess what? You get to give it a five. You should really like your idea. It's okay if you get your card back. Read and score. Read and score. Again, if you got your card back, it's a great idea. Give it a five. This is our second of four rounds. Everybody ready? Okay. Exchange. Make sure, move around the room so you see different cards. Cards should travel. Okay, read and score. Everybody ready? Last time. Go ahead and exchange. Exchange. Say hi to a friend. Go ahead and score. Last score. While you're back there, add up the score on the back. If you have six scores, randomly strike two. You should have four scores on the card. Just add them up. So again, this is called a crowdsourcing exercise. It's a way to surface ideas from the room. Um, if you can use it in meetings, you can use it as a structure for collecting ideas. It's, it's really fun to see kind of stuff surface. Um, so, who has a 25? Who has a score that got five, 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 four, five, or no, 20, excuse me, 20. Four fives. 
We have a 25. Where's the microphone, Bill? 20, 20. I originally thought of five, five rounds, so, but I wanted to get you guys out of here. So can you read us the idea? Homeless, homeless outreach and mental health outreach. noting that many of our um, homeless have challenges related to mental health, so. No other 25s, right? Oh, 20s, thank you. Yeah, 20. Mm -hmm. They're not on the card. And that's okay. One of the things it says is that people in the room saw homelessness and outreach and mental health outreach and said, that's something we should be doing more of. What that looks like, the colors and the shapes of that, can be defined by a set of people you bring together to say, like, let's think about what this could look like. Let's talk to the mental health space and say, well, how can we make sure more of these resources get connected into? Because this is interesting, too, that it said homelessness outreach and mental health. Isn't it interesting that it puts it both together? If, if that person wants to identify themselves, that they said that, they can say more about what, but we don't have to know that to know it was a good idea in the room that we talked about today. So, um, and that can be follow-up information. That person who shared that idea can reach out to Ann and say, this is what I had a thought of. It sounds like there's some, a lot of excitement in the room about it. A 19, a score of 19. A score of 18. Oh, 18, yes, go ahead. Uh, Super Sunday, if everyone on Super Bowl Sunday uh, could donate a canned good to their local, uh, from their local grocery store to the food bank or, or a collection uh, center. It's had eight, a score of 18 and I crossed one out. There was one, two, three, Even four, five, no. six exchanges. <laughs> I mean, you just collected how many gift cards? Who knows how many? 75,000. 75, yeah. How many uh, canned goods can you collect if you just ask? Actually, the, the Presbyterian churches in Austin right now are having a competition amongst the youth to see which church can collect the most canned goods for Super Sunday. Yay. You can also call it Soup or Sunday. Super Sunday, yeah. <laughs> So that got 18. And again, this is not something that, you know, is, uh, maybe people saw that and were like, hey, that's really something we could do tomorrow. That's really easily implementable. It's not a grant program. <laughs> that's great. Hey, look, action. We have something we're doing. Let's see if we have a 17. Oh, Ken, go ahead. <laughs> Common faith-based uh, personal finance curriculum to help at-risk families create and stick to budgets and build self-reliance. Um, able to be leveraged by any nonprofit or faith group. At-risk families. Think um, about, um, is that a 17 or 16? 17. 17. Think about all the different uh, communities, faith communities that already host financial literacy classes, Financial Peace University, or the curriculums that Dave Ramsey hosts, and say, how could more populations receive some of that information that might be vulnerable pop communities as opposed to just you know working families, perhaps? So. Um, it leverages an existing strength that might be present in a lot of our communities that could be connected to other services and program activities. So, 16. Two 16s, yay. Okay, yeah, right here. In San Antonio, coordinate social services in one website with all contact, I think it's contact, information and services provided. All agencies have access at that free website. Hey! Got it. Huh? It's coming Say it. Out. It could be an idea that we had, and so people are, are noting that this would be something that would be helpful 
and would be a great thing that we could have. And this is, again, so what you're working on is a good thing. Yay, that's a good thing. Um, I saw somebody recently say, um, when everyone starts saying what you've always been saying, don't be frustrated, realize they're coming alongside you. <laughs> you're in good company. So, um, so be excited that the thing that's on the board is something you're already working on. Other 16 idea. At three, excellent. I said, okay, go ahead. Encourage the living wage by all groups. Wow. So here, let's talk about this real quick. Um, that uh, self-care is also reflected in how we reimburse people that work in nonprofits. <laughs> Just saying. Um, and so how we think about and how we support people in the services industry that or the nonprofits where we're working is a, something we need to wrestle with and think through. It's a part of self-care if we're taking care of the people we're working with uh, appropriately. So hard, <laughs> yeah. The challenges, yeah, but something we should wrestle with and think through. So how are we reflecting what we want to see in the community happen within our own organizations? Something to wrestle with. Uh, other 16 idea? Yes, to have a safe place for pastors and families of all de denominations to come together and address the physical and mental and spiritual wellness. Ooh. Uh, could we start a sign up list for that? <laughs> <laughs> One. I've even seen. Um, Let's, let's stop there. I've got the, let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, uh, and we'll collect the cards and then we'll be able to see the other scores. There may be some that are in that top tier that, that would surface, that would bring about some exciting ideas. Um, there are um, f uh, faith leaders I've seen online who've started online safe spaces where like just discussion boards where clergy can come together from across the country and just share that they're worried about things. Um, and I think it can be a really powerful way to kind of disaggregate, and again, a way to address risk. If I'm talking to a clergy who's in Minnesota, and I'm, they're struggling, and I'm struggling here in San Antonio, does it make it safer for me to talk about some of the things I'm struggling with? Because it's not going to get back around that um, ministry leader X is having a challenge. Um, it can be a way, disaggregating relationships from risk can be a way of managing risk. Um, so... How do we create safe places, I think, can be a great thing. The other thing we're working on in, in uh, mental health is really promoting self-care in mental health work in general, too, and mental health self-care among clergy. Uh, one of the things we want to work on is a toolkit for seminaries to implement to promote self-care in seminaries so that seminary seminarians um, and anybody working in a religious training institution can be thinking about mental health needs before they go into ministry when they're experiencing all the stress of ministry. Um, so we're, we're thinking about some of those things nationally as well. So, and, uh, and I don't mind hosting, I don't mind U University of Carter Works hosting the first safe space meeting. Ooh. Ooh. Hey. Bam. <laughs> You're just like that. And I just met you. <laughs> so see, like, see how there are already things. We're going to do an action alert from one idea. We are leveraging existing strengths. We see that there's something really specific around homeless outreach and connecting to mental health. Um, this has just brought up. So thank one, thank you, and let's thank each other for sharing the ideas that we shared. <laughs> um, know that these are areas that we can take steps in, and you guys can use this strategy moving forward. You can use it in the workshops that you, or the little discussion groups around the conversations. You can Action just, teams. And action our, teams mm -hmm. can bring up these ideas and say, hey, let's surface the things that we think would be great. You can, you can actually also do it, um, you can bring different action teams together um, so that you can have outside perspective, mm -hmm. um, so that you can get a new perspective on ideas. Yeah. So it's a great strategy for really surfacing ideas. So. Um, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you for allowing me to spend time with you all. Um, I've been encouraged. I hope you have too. Um, and I hope that we can continue um, from the national level connecting to you all here in the city and the great work that you're doing through Anne and with, in partnership with Anne uh, in the city to really strengthen and serve your community. It's, it's such an honor to participate and to celebrate what you all are doing and to take that back and to think about what that means for us nationally. So thank you so much.
So I also uh, want to do a couple other thank yous and some information. All of the different kind of brochures and flyers, I've organized them. They're in the table out there, and you can get more of whatever's there. So you can take that. Don't forget to mark your calendars for April 30th, which is the next one of these. Plus, I wrote down up here that compassion skill training in terms of systems, highly recommend it. Um, our civic leaders are going through this training, as in our council person, staff, our mayor, staff. So there's no reason the rest of the other leaders shouldn't be taking it too, right? Right. Um, I want to thank all of us because it was our federal tax dollars that got Ben here today. <laughs> to Woo! For all of us, right? Isn't it nice when you see those things that moving, right? I also have, you know, we really go all out here when it comes to gifts. And um, I don't have a budget, just so you know. <laughs> anyway, so this mug that you've been drinking out of, Ben, was created by a San Antonio artist. So there we got a San Antonio mug. You've got a Compassion toolkit that doesn't look anything like your toolkits from the grassroots of Compassion at San Antonio. You've got an extraordinary journal from uh, the Department of Human Services. You can never have too many journals. And I really want you to read the card. So I just ran into the card today. And it says... Holy crap! <laughs> that was awesome! Yay for Ben! Thank you all for coming. <laughs>